Welcome to the March regular meeting of the Collingswood Board of Education. Notice of this meeting has been appropriately advertised. Uh, roll call, please. All right, now I saw most of the board members, but I am gonna go through the whole list because now my screen is split, so I'm not seeing everyone. Um, Mr. Connor. Present. Mr. Chu. Here. Mr. Craig. Here. Ms. Henry. Here. Ms. Mello. Here. Ms. Rivera. Here. Thanks. Mrs. Severino. Here. Mrs. Celia. Here. Mr. Stotts. Here. Mrs. Wood. Mrs. Wood. And Mrs. Caden. Here. Thank you. Uh, at this time, we, uh, if you wish to stand, um, please do so for the Pledge of Allegiance. I pledge just allegiance to the flag okay. of the United My States of America. Look at that for you! For it stands, one nation, nation. under God, okay, with liberty and justice for us. So Can I make an announcement? If everybody could just please mute themselves. There's a lot of people on this meeting. And if I can hear what's going on in your home, nobody else can hear anything that's going on in the board meeting. Thank you. Okay, Mrs. Katie. Uh, so we have no executive session at this time. Uh, we are going to move to uh, committee of the whole. Do I have a motion to go into committee of the whole? So moved. And a second? Second. second. All in favor? Aye. 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 All right. So. Board members, tonight I asked uh, Mrs. Coleman to talk with us to give us a little bit more information about the incoming um, ESSER funds and what that means and how uh, those are being provided out um, to, to provide a bit more clarity um, for that moving forward. And just as a reminder, this is Committee of the Whole, so the the, the point of this, this particular session of the board meeting is for all of the board members to be able to uh, have an open discussion with each other, with M Mrs. Coleman, Dr. McDowell, um, to talk through some of these issues. So please, if you have questions or thoughts or ideas, um, share them during the session. It's a little strange over Zoom, but I, I think we can make it work. So Mrs. Coleman, can you give us a little a rundown of, of how this will, will work from what you know for, so far? All right, so what I know as of now and on uh, February 19th, um, I received notification from the New Jersey Department of Education of um, a, an allocation of ESSER funds, elementary and secondary um, emergency relief funds, of which um, Collingswood is entitled under their allocation table $1.2 million. Um, of the $1.2 million, um, where there's $1.2 million, that's a, just a general allocation, then $82,000 for learning acceleration and then 45,000 for mental health services. Um, there's not a, much, a whole lot of guidance that I can say at this time, but I will say they have kind of broad brush given some guidance in that the, the general allocation, the 1.2 million can be used for facility type projects to improve air quality and HVAC. Um, so Mr. Craig, um, is chairing an ad hoc committee of, of the board members right now to look into facilities issues of which some of these uh, funds could be used, which would be great if we could do some of these, some of the items that we've wanted to do but couldn't fit within our local budget that will fit within this federal funding. And then the 80,000 for accelerated um, learning, um, I believe um, we're in early discussions with Dr. McDowell and the admins, but a, a very comprehensive uh, summer summer planning, summer school, and then mental health services, which we luckily in Collingswood, we kind of, as of the 2019 separate proposal was approved. Um, we've hit the ground running with mental health services in, in, in the district. So we're already well, well versed in providing these, but it, it does uh, provide an additional source of funds for those services. What's not known is if the services could also be for staff. That's some of the questions that have come up that just says mental health services. Um, it doesn't say whether it's, you know, for uh, people who work in the district or for pupils. Um, but again, a lot, a lot going on. Um, I was revising the budget up until about 3.30 today because Trenton included account numbers for these funds. So I had to revise um, 
both Collingswood and Oakland district budgets to include these funds. Um, so I did do that, um, but not a whole lot of guidance. As of yet, uh, the grant application was supposed to be open and available um, today. Um, no shocker, uh, it's not, um, but I will be checking um, every day this week. Hopefully when they open the grant application, there'll be a, m a much more uh, robust description of the programs that um, they'll allow under this funding. But I am very excited at the 1.2 million, we should pr probably be able to do at least two projects in the district that we've been wanting to do. So that's what I know as of today. Could you, could you explain a little bit what you mean by when that they are going to be opening the grant application? Because I think that gets a little confusing since we kind of know the numbers, but then right. there's a grant application. So could you help? Yes. Um, the state of New Jersey has a separate grant application portal. We actually have to log on, even those, though these are entitlement funds and every district's entitled to them, we still have to complete um, a, robust, a robust grant application explaining how we are going to A, spend the funds, and then like when it comes to uh, summer school and learning objectives, how we're gonna measure before we spend it and after we measure. Um, and then there's a whole payment application process. And what's, I don't know at this time is if the funds will be, in the past federal funds came to the district and then we spent it and if we didn't spend any funds, they took it back. Now we have to basically encumber the funds and start spending them and then put in for reimbursement. So what's not known is of the 1.2 million we need to obligate and start spending before we'll, we get the funds. My guess is that is what is going to have to happen because that's what they did with the CARES funding that we got over the summer that we used to purchase a lot of the, the shields on the desks and the uh, personal protective equipment and hand sanitizers and um, the, the cleaning supplies, um, that, that all came out of CARES, but we had to spend it and then ask for reimbursement later. Uh, but it is a separate grant application process that we have to do. So we submit the grant and we wait for Trent to approve it. Once it's approved, then we can then obligate and start moving forward. Um, but we have to detail in there what exactly we wanna do and it's gotta be approved before we can do anything, <laughs> typically. Beth, Beth Ann, with, with yes. that, um, thank you for, for, for laying that out. Is there a chance that the funding changes at all then with the grant? And then the other piece is do all of the costs that go into this grant have to be things that are now new costs to the district or could these be old things that we were paying, paying for with this? That's, money? that's what's kind of confusing. I believe it can be old things. Okay. Typically with federal funds, you can't supplant, mm -hmm. which means if it's something that's already included in your general fund budget, you can't t pick it up out of the general fund and put it in the federal. Yeah. Right, it's got to be something brand new, typically. But what the federal government did um, with the CARES money over the summer is they said you can supplant. So if you had cleaning supplies in your budget, you could reimburse yourselves basically for the cost of uh, the cleaning supplies with these funds and then you could buy additional. Um, so my understanding is you can supplant and then you can also do new. Um, again, I haven't, there's not a whole lot of guidance, but that's my understanding from Trenton as of, as of now. Um, did I answer the, did you have a second part? Yeah, to that question? I, I think the, the other one was about potentially with funding changing, but then I think the, and again, the other, that is, yeah, the 1.2 million that was on the Department of Education's website. If you, mm -hmm. um, I guess, go to ESSER or go to grants, they had an allocation table. So you could go by county and by district and it lists your expected allocation. Um, it, my, I'm guessing it's going to go up based on everything I'm reading and the new federal stimulus that was just released that Biden signed, um, but I haven't received a new allocation notice. So what's being put in the school district budget and what's gonna be submitted to the county office for review with our budget is the original allocation because that I actually have a table from the Department of Ed. Um, I don't have anything on the new stimulus funds. So that's what's being submitted. I fully envision because this was rolled out, and again, it's not the state's fault, but it was rolled out so late from the Fed that all the BAs now we're all like revising our budgets. Um, if they change the allocations, we will have to revise the budget between tonight's meeting and the April meeting. So it's quite possible we'll be we'll be approving a different number in April, but not for your main budget. It'll be for your grant budget, your fund twenty section of the budget only. Okay. So um, that's and I, if, if that's the case, and I'll walk everybody through it again in April. Um, so if the allocation does go up, then obviously I'll change it and. But that won't affect the tax levy or, or anything else. That's um, your grant section of the budget. 
with regard to, oh, oh, yes. Sorry, I was going to say, with regards to the learning acceleration portion, this might be more of a question or a conversation with Dr. McDowell. Mm -hmm. um, I think it's great that the district has already started thinking about how we can address some of these learning gaps that have already are, are already obviously there um, this summer. But since this is a three year, we have three years with this money. Yes, yes. I'm sorry, um, I forgot to say that we have to 2023. Yeah. yeah. Um, I'm just wondering, um, Dr. McDowell, I don't know how the rest of the board is thinking about this, but does it make sense to also sort of thinking about instead of, in addition to the summer, thinking about maybe something that can be throughout the school year, because I'm just thinking um, as the school year starts and, you know, we can sort of use assessments that are already happening in, you know, that are happening in the school and then you have families involved and you have sort of real time instruction going on. And then you already have the interventions happening in the classroom. So I just feel like you might get more bang for your buck as you're going through, you know, throughout the school year, if you're doing some interventions there too. So I just, I'm sure that's already on the radar. I'm just wondering, you know, that was just my two cents. So not spending it all this summer. Not that anyone's thinking that we were going. Right. To so in our initial, our initial um, thinking is to look at this on a two year continuum, build capacity this summer, um, to carry through the year, reassess what worked uh, this summer, um, and then institute round two for the next year, which gives us a, a, um, a robust amount of summer enrichment and acceleration programs for the next two years. And then while we are building the capacity during the summer, the work actually manifests during the year. So I think that um, if we, if we play, if we, if we leverage these resources, properly, it'll put us on a path where we potentially could see a much longer term net effect. Um, but right now we're looking at at least two years of implementation with the acceleration and then really reinforcing the mental health piece with the, the funds from on the mental health side. Gotcha. Okay. Thank you. Piggybacking on what Mary just said, um, my question was, and I, maybe I just don't understand it enough. Um, there's 80 some thousand dollars for um, for accelerated learning. Is that the maximum we could spend out of this grant, or is it what has to be spent? And when, if, like Mary said, like the true loss may not be realized right away, we may not find out what kids are going to need until well into next year. Are we able to spend more on that if needed? So, well, those, those funds are funds from the grant, but there's nothing that precludes us from adding funds to our planning as it relates with summer, using summer as a, 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 a leverage month or a, a leverage period. So, I mean, we just have an additional 82,000 in order to help with that work. So I think that the next step for us is once we have clear guidance on what we can or cannot use the funds for, um, we will be reconvening the uh, a summer programming team that convenes every year um, with uh, more definitive marching orders. But yes, we're we are not restricted to just the eighty two thousand dollars. At the end, this is Bill. Uh, hey, Bill. Can can I ask a question? It's a it's on that subject, but just a little bit different. Uh, sure. You had indicated that the expenditure end of the budget won't change. The uh, grant section uh, could change. It stands independently. But if there's something in the regular budget that can be pulled out and put into the grant section, that would reduce the expenditures under the uh, standard budget, uh, which in fact would then reduce the tax rate. Uh, would it not? Or am I missing? Correct. Something? If the finance committee of both boards decides to, to do that, if there's something in the general fund budget that we can fit in, if, if once I get the list of allowable expenses, if there's things that are in the budget that can be moved, like for existence, um, Collingswood, and I did it also in Oakland, uh, some of the summer school programming that we had in the budget, typically we budget some funds for uh, summer programming. Uh -huh. I did take that out because both districts are gonna be planning a more robust summer programming. So I didn't want it to be um, duplicative. So I did, I did already start adjusting for those things that I knew were allowable. Okay. I mean, okay. I, th I think that like people see the total, right? Like 1.2 plus 85 plus like 45, uh, but it's really not that much money when you start dividing it over the three year period and it can't go beyond that three years. So any changes to budget have to be 
put back in within three years anyway, um, because all of this, the, the 1.2 has to be spent out within the next three years. And it goes, I mean, it goes fast. I know 1.2 million is a lot of money, but at the same time, it's, it, it'll go quick. Um, especially when we're talking about, you know, um, the total population of the two districts, how many, you know, students that we have, it's, it's not that much money per student or per pupil. Um, when you start breaking it down. Uh, that that uh, 1.2 million uh, also does not include Oakland. Oakland has their own uh, section, own award. Correct. But to Clinton's point, that is something that I was thinking about that, you know, because I, I, as I'm thinking about like how we think through these funds that, you know, prioritizing the needs and also coming up with the timeline is important, but also whatever, um, let's say for the general fund, which at the moment seems to be the, the part that's the least specific in terms of what it can be used for. But if you know we go out and hire 10 new teachers, well, that's, that's not a long-term solution because three years from now, I don't know where those salaries go. So you know, just thinking about um, the different options that we have and you know, sure, maybe um, if we're, you know, we're talking about September and this year might be a little bit different than Hopefully, hopefully in two and three years, we're not having the issue of possibly having um, to deal with these issues with the pandemic that we are now. But, you know, if we could hire more teachers for a te on a temporary basis or something like that, that's a possibility. But thinking about it in a in the scope of what Clinton just said, that we all this money goes away after three years. It's not a it's not forever that this has been added to our budget. That's an important thing for all of us to keep in mind as we're, we're coming up with. Uh, mm -hmm. I, have a question. I could say my experience is, you know, like outside of the board, like professionally, I mean, they're, they've been pretty liberal with their use of some of these funds, like the CARES Act funding, but it's not always real world applicable. Like I can hire staff, but there has to be staff to hire. Well, right? that's so like, um, you know, that sort of presumes that there's all these um, certified teachers floating around in South Jersey that are looking to be hired. So like whatever plan that we move forward, not only does it have to be mindful that this is a short term, um, but it also has to be mindful that there are finite resources in the world, um, in, in, especially when it comes to certified teachers who unfortunately, um, the, the number of teachers has been decreasing year over year for the last decade. I mean, Rowan frequently talks about how that people just aren't going into the education field anymore because they've been beat up so much um, that, you know, whatever solution we have has to be mindful of that three-year timeline. Kiria, you were, you were about to say something? Yeah, well, actually, part of my second question was going to be around capacity and kind of pointing out what Clayton just did. That his point, but also the point that it takes months to find the right person. So we could have plans that very well don't get implemented until months into the school year. Um, but my other, my question, my initial question was, I know that the it's a three year uh, cycle. Are we being, for lack of a better word, forced to use a certain percentage each year or can we at least decide let's say that we want to really make the next two years extremely robust to catch that kind of divide that the education divide that's going to be you know really evident more evident after post pandemic or are we forced to use it staggered um, I, I haven't seen the application but I don't think they're going to force us to use a certain percentage every year um, they didn't do that with the, the CARES funds, obviously, they, but they do, what they did with the CARES was we had um, some performance reports we had to fill out along the way. Every few months, they wanted a status on what we were doing, like what we did with the funds, what we were able to do with the funds, basically, and how much we spent. And a lot of my report was still waiting for the Chromebooks, right? Still waiting for this, still waiting for that. Um, my understanding is with this application, it'll be a it'll be a similar process where they're going to ask for um, interim performance reports from the districts as to where we are with spending the funds and where we are with um, the activities that we told them that we were going to implement. Um, but again, I haven't seen it, but that's my that's my anticipation. I think that 
has me thinking the Chromebooks and also to Clinton's point that we're, we're now competing with districts in our area that also now have uh, this windfall of money, but then districts, I mean, all across the country, yeah. getting much more money than they thought they had. So when I think about uh, facilities projects and getting people out and getting them done in a timely manner, the, the, the quicker that we can move on some of this stuff, I think the better, but I think that's also true with certified staff, with tech, with anything else that we're going to use on this. We need to Correct. Be, be acting quickly here. Yeah, Matt, that, that's a good point. You, the spending it on staff is, is probably, it, while it has to happen, obviously there, there has to be some spending on staff, uh, that's expenditures that will continue. If mm -hmm. you do maintenance projects, uh, that's one and done and you've spent the money and it's gone. Uh, I, yeah, exactly. I, uh, I, I also wouldn't recommend holding money until year three to spend. Uh, I, I was on the board when Governor Christie came in and decided that we didn't need the surplus that we had saved up over the years and he took it all back. So there was nothing that would stop the government uh, in year two or in year three saying, oh, we're only kidding. Uh, if the money's not here anymore, you're, you're out. You have to do it on your own. If we've already spent the money on the, on the maintenance project, uh, that's gone and they're not going to get that back. So keep that in mind as well. And yeah, I mean, I'm not like against hiring or like phase, like bringing in additional staff and phasing them out over the three year grant period. I'm just, you know, I think that like whatever plan that we have has to be mindful that I have seen programs throughout the state submit proposals to the state saying they're going to bring in 20 additional teachers. And then after 10 months, they've only been able to hire two. And they've ended up having to return significant amounts of money because their plan wasn't able to come to fruition because of a lack of um, people to actually physically hire. Um, so I, I just think it, like the plan has to be mindful of those things. And I'm sure, and I, I would love to hear from facility, like you know, the facilities folks about, you know, there's always regulations that change over time. I know. Um, there's new rules coming out all the time about how much fresh air has to be implemented into a new HVAC system compared to recycled air that used to be the norm in a lot of facilities, like where, you know, where we are on that and, and just things of that nature that would help, you know, kind of get us through this, this time period and also create long-term benefit for the, the district. I think Fiona has her hand up. I was just about to say that. Yeah, I, I do. Thank you. Um, so You're speaking, speaking of staff, um, so I'm interested, I'm sure this is all in the works. It sounds like there's a lot to, to still sort out what is, is and is not allowed to spend the money on. But um, I'm interested in hearing feedback from our teaching staff um, who would be facilitating these summer programmings. And on that note, um, also, um, interested in hearing about any special considerations that we would take to support these teachers, um, especially after this difficult um, year of teaching during the pandemic, and also identification of students. I'm not, um, how we would identify them. I'm not necessarily proposing those questions right now. I'm just saying those are um, areas that I'm interested in hearing more about as um, the whole board, hearing more about as, as it comes along. So um, how we're gonna identify which students um, are identified for these summer programs and then um, our staff, if our staff, how we will support our staff after this tough year that they've already had. I think those are great points, Fiona. I don't know that anyone, uh, the Dr. McDowell has all of those answers right now, but I'm sure that's a curriculum committee discussion for next month. Absolutely. <laughs> some of those, some of those questions will be answered in um, the series of teacher focus groups. So um, we've already had um, one uh, a site visit uh, so far with two teacher focus groups at that site visit where they were able to give us some really good feedback on what specific supports they need for us to get to that next normal. Um, we have another uh, school site visit in series of teacher focus groups on Friday. So as we go through each and every school site, um, we will be able to uh, get that valuable information, which will ultimately inform that plan. And I know that in terms of that summer uh, planning team, uh, teachers will be included in the planning team. Thank you very much. 
I'm just taking a look at the time. It's a few minutes till seven, and usually we allotted about a half an hour um, for these kind of discussions. So I don't know if anyone had um, any last minute points that they, they wanted to raise. I think we, this was a, a pretty good discussion and thinking through you know priorities and timeline. And as usual, when it comes with any sort of funding that comes from the state or the federal government, a lot of it is to be determined uh, or awaiting got more guidance. But um, if anybody wanted to add anything else. I think I can see most board members shockingly on my screen right now, I'll figure that'll end soon. But um, if anyone else wanted to say anything. All right, so um, thank you, Beth Ann, for, for giving us a rundown. And we no doubt will be having a lot more, like I said, discussions um, about this in committee meetings. And I'm sure there will be updates in the next couple of, um, of meetings as well, uh, board meetings, excuse me. Uh, so with that, uh, do I have a motion to come out of Committee of the Whole? So moved. Moved. And a second. Second. Sorry. All in favor? I'm sorry, um, who, who, who seconded? Uh, Matt, correct. Thank you. Just so I can't see everybody, so I'm sorry. Thank you. All right, so we are moving on to section four of our agenda, which is presentations. And uh, Ms. Coleman is up again to present the 2021-2022 uh, the school year budget. Can you see it by any chance? No. Or is it still at the agenda? Still the agenda. All right, hold on. All right, looks like I have to stop sharing and then open up again. How's that? Better? There it is. All right. So very quick, I'm not going to keep everyone long. We have a very long agenda tonight, um, but I the 2021-2022 uh, budget is um, on the agenda tonight for approval to go to the County Office of Education for review and approval. The final budget adoption will be at the April board meeting. Um, so I just say that it's the board's largest policies where we, we put our money where, where our mouths are and um, just kind of a look ahead. I really have made no adjustments in the areas of any of the uh, services or staffing or facility needs in the district based on what we currently have. Um, we have new leadership in the district and with everything that's going on in the world of education, uh, it, you're kind of, I'm on quicksand as I'm budgeting, but I made no wholesale adjustments or changes to the budget as far as programming. Um, the biggest chain, like, change, like I said in the last presentation, are the, is the ESSER funds. So a lot of our focus is going to be on how we utilize those funds to get the biggest bang for our buck um, in the district. Um, so here's your 2021-2022 budget. Total revenues of 30, 36 million. I'm sorry, 678,310. Uh, local tax levy um, is 47.6%. State aid is 29.4%. Um, budgeted fund balance with your reserves. We're bringing in 200,000 from maintenance reserve to support maintenance pro projects and 85,000 from capital reserve um, to support a bleacher project uh, we have ongoing in the district. Um, and then your expenses. Again, revenue expenses do match. Instruction is 65% of the budget. Uh, student services, that'll be your counseling, your nurses, your child study team, uh, it's 14% of your budget. Administration is 9%. Um, and facility costs are 12% currently in the budget. Um, last year's tax levy, 17.1 million. Uh, the 2021-2022 tax levy, 17,465. It's a 2% increase in the taxes, difference of $342,000 um, the, to the district in the, in the form of revenue. We did see an increase in state aid this year, and we had some miscellaneous revenues go up in the district um, in the way of uh, GIF refunds from your joint insurance funds. That's helped balance out the budget. So the average household in Collingswood, average house 231,000. So taxes to an average house of 231 is $70.61. And I just leave this slide. The next slide I leave up, um, we belong to a lot of shared services in our area, um, all of which help to save a lot of money. And as they come up through the year, um, and I, I'm constantly looking for other co-ops to join um, to save to save monies. But the biggest one that we really see the bang for the buck lately is uh, your GIFs. Um, 
this year, we got $176,000 back from the school's health insurance fund, um, which is going to be put towards premium. And uh, we're getting about $26,000 we'll be getting next month from the GIF. So these little pockets of money do actually help defray um, some of the increased costs that we have in the district. Um, trash removal, the Oakland P Public Works has not increased the cost of trash removal since we started that contract with them over 10 years ago. And with that, it was very short and sweet. I was uh, still working on this as of 3.30 this afternoon. In April, there'll be a, a larger presentation where Dr. McDowell and I will go more into the, the programming in the district. But again, I've started this budget in um, November, December um, under Dr. Oswald. I kind of finished it up today. Didn't make a whole lot of changes, like I said. Um, my goal was to balance out um, balance out the budget, keep, keep it efficient and lean. And uh, that's it. Any questions from the board members on the budget? And again, this is on in section 11 for uh, approval tonight to go to the state for review. Any questions? Okay. Thank you, Mrs. Goldman. Um, she had shared most of the, the, the budget um, ins and outs with us during the committee uh, meetings last week anyway, but um, Thank you for putting it into a presentation, and um, that's great to hear that there's no that we didn't have to make any major changes in in programming or personnel. That's always huge. Um, so moving on to section five, future dates and miscellaneous information. Uh, just a couple of important dates to note: spring break is uh, finally here, April second to the ninth, and, and also of note that the week after, April twelfth to the sixteenth, will be a full remote week in um, Collinswood and Oakland to accommodate uh, travel and the need to quarantine for both uh, students and staff. And then you can um, join us back here next month on April 26th for our board meeting at 6.30. Moving on to section six, routine board business. First, we have the approval of the minutes of the February 22nd, 2021 regular board meeting. Do Why are we moving on past spring break so fast? Do I have a motion? So moved. So moved. And a second. 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 All in favor. Aye. 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 Uh, next, we have um, section 6.02, the school reopening plan. Dr. McDowell, I know you are taking the lead on this. Okay. Brian, am, am I a co-host? You are now. Okay. I just made you co-host, so you should be able to share your screen. Okay. Can you see the screen? Yes. Yes. Okay. Uh, so good evening, everyone. Um, we appreciate you coming out to join us this evening. Um, we have a, a robust um, presentation that will have multiple speakers tonight. So we ask um, for your patience while we move through some pretty um, uh, challenging information that affects us all. So we will get, uh, we will get right into it. So when we think about um, the year that we've had, I know that 2020 has been a very interesting year. It's not the year that we asked for, but it is the year that we have to be responsive to. Um, and it has been a, 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 a year uh, for the record books. I think that one of the most important things uh, that we can uh, be cognizant of was stated by our current uh, president when saying that addressing the impact of the coronavirus will be the greatest operational challenge of our generation. It's going to take time. We have to stay vigilant and we have to stay focused. And despite this general, uh, this multiple uh, generation disruption and setback, what we have done is we've worked together as a community to make sure that we are taking appropriate data-informed steps to reduce community spread and transmission of this deadly virus. We fully acknowledge the burden and challenge that the pandemic has placed on our families and caregivers, 
and appreciate your support as we work through all of the items associated with the logistics and planning essential to a safe return to full-time in-person instruction. So to take us back to the beginning of the year, um, we introduced in August of 2020, our Welcome Back plan. Uh, the Welcome Back uh, plan was a phased plan, which really focused on four areas of concentration aligned with specific guidance coming from the Department of Education. One of those areas were uh, setting the conditions for learning, leadership and planning, policy and funding, and ultimately continuity of learning. So we began the year in September with introducing our staff to that new normal and moving through the progression of building our capacity to slowly phase in students and staff uh, based on the challenges associated with an abrupt end uh, in March of 2020. So we took a measured approach in order to move in that particular direction. So we have uh, uh, to this point since October 19th, been implementing a hybrid learning plan in addition to making sure that we offered a full-time remote option for families that chose into that based on the executive order coming from uh, the state of New Jersey to give families choices about uh, where uh, they felt most comfortable to be able to send their children. We issued a, uh, a family uh, and caregiver survey or check-in which mimicked and was similar to the check-in that was issued back in September of 2020 so that we could contrast and compare the findings and then ultimately use that information to inform our planning and our next steps as we uh, move into an area of phased mitigation and expansion of access to in-person instruction. So this past month, uh, we issued a survey um, when you uh, uh, back out our, our uh, preschool population, we had a total of uh, a little over 1,900 uh, respondents. The distribution of those respondents was pretty balanced uh, K through 12, uh, as well as good participation uh, between our uh, sister district in Oakland. We want to thank you for providing that necessary feedback, but I believe that uh, there is some confusion in the community about this targeted data collection. The purpose of this short survey was to get a quick check-in from families and caregivers. And it was never intended to be a robust data collection instrument. A more detailed version of data collection will take place once we have released um, our expanding and reinventing Collingswood and Oakland Schools transition plan, which will be for public consumption and feedback. So, so far the overall uh, responses have been pretty evenly split between elementary and secondary. In addition, um, when thinking about the diversity of our student population, we also had significant representation among our students uh, who have IEPs or 504 plans with um, a, 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 a pretty good distribution between elementary, middle, as well as high school. In addition, we also wanted to ascertain uh, preference in terms of preferred model of instruction among our families and our caregivers. The responses indicate that elementary learners prefer live instruction, whereas our secondary learners uh, tend to shift and, and prefer remote instruction. By the way, all of this information will be made readily av available on our district website later this week. In addition to thinking about the preferred schedule of services, the data that we collected indicates that the majority of respondents prefer uh, as much in-person instruction as possible over the others, uh, which was uh, heavier at the elementary level, whereas at the secondary level, um, we did see a split in the data where there was still a large enough constituency that prefers that full remote platform where we are working to, to engage uh, our middle and our high school learners differently um, because there is different levels of capacity in those spaces because they're larger facilities. In terms of satisfaction, we realize that there is a nuance associated with our data collection. Uh, this, the questions that were asked around satisfaction were not based on normal circumstances. This has not been a normal year. We are fully aware that the uh, data contextualized and relates to in the midst of a global pandemic and crisis, 
what has been the level of satisfaction with respondents indicating that they were either satisfied or very satisfied in a range of 75 to 77 percent based on the current circumstances. When we think about phased mitigation, there has been an ongoing de debate that is, that is fierce and often divisive over the reopening of schools. So as a school district, we are balancing the need to make choices informed by the evidence and the demands from our school communities. We are actively engaged in a thorough review of what the science tells us while balancing the lived experiences and perspectives of teachers, support staff, parents and caregivers, and students, keeping in mind that uh, a balanced and measured approach means that we have to take into consideration all of these amazing groups. So we're actively engaged in the planning process and will continue to use data to provide insight into what parameters to plan for. We have been transparent and consistent around our intent to follow CDC mitigation guidelines for K-12 schools. Also following through with the initial promises made during our welcome back plan, previously released in August, with the understanding that updated COVID information and community transmission rates um, are shared on a weekly basis throughout Camden County uh, by our public health officials. And as we get new information, we will continue to evolve, shift our thinking and focus on transitioning as many of our students back to full-time in-person instruction. We are pleased to report that uh, one powerful measure and a step in the right direction is the district partnering with Jefferson Health. And we were able to uh, vaccinate a large percentage of our staff, which helps move us um, uh, further into that particular direction. So we wanna give special thanks to the Board of Education for helping to facilitate this, as well as our partners within Jefferson Health, um, which helps us move in the right direction to uh, return to full-time in-person instruction in the near, near future. There has been discussion regarding uh, spring break. So we made the decision for all schools to move into full remote after spring break, which was a similar decision that we made as a district um, after the Thanksgiving break for a few reasons. One, there is a statewide shortage on substitute teachers, which our uh, schools are very lean when it comes to staffing and ultimately staff that are available to be able to support our students. And uh, what, would, what happened was based on schools assessing where they fell within the continuum of who was and was not traveling, who would and would not need to quarantine, there were operational circumstances that led us to make this decision. We also did not want to penalize students or staff um, who opted to travel, um, and we did not want to uh, not be able to deliver on a continuity of service and support by having some schools be able to open, other schools not be able to open due to operational safety issues. And thus, uh, we made the decision several weeks in advance in order to communicate this as our plan to eliminate the need for both students, staffs, and their, uh, to quarantine after the spring break. So this provides us uh, an opportunity to make sure that each of our school community members um, is, has the opportunity to recharge and boost their stamina, even though the state is still strongly discouraging uh, out of region travel, which we will continue to do so. Uh, but this was the decision that we made, which we felt was in the best um, interest of our collective school community. When we think about expanding and reinventing Collingswood schools. It really starts with the guidance, the guidance coming from our federal, state, and county public health officials. Schools should determine in collaboration with state and local <coughs> health officials to the extent possible, whether and how to implement each of the considerations while adjusting to meet the needs and circumstances of our local community. Implementation should be guided by what is feasible, practical, acceptable, and tailored to the needs of our, of our students. It's also extremely important that we develop strategies that can be revised and adapted dependent on the level of viral transmission in the schools and throughout the communities with the understanding that this has the potential to change pretty rapidly. So some of the uh, uh, guidance that we're using to inform our strategy are the CDC's operational strategy for K-12 schools, 
the CDC COVID-19 tracker for Camden County, the New Jersey Department of Education, the Road Back Restart and Recovery, as well as the New Jersey Department of Health COVID-19 Activity Level Index Report, which focuses on the Southwest region, excuse me, Southwest region. I think it's also important for us to put the data in context so that we're all looking at the same information at the same time. When we think about the thresholds for community transmission, the CDC has four categories of transmission, low, blue, moderate, yellow, substantial, orange, and high, red. They look at a seven day continuum. These are the most recent indicators that have been updated as of February. And what ends up happening is, is the total number of cases per 100,000 persons within the last seven days helps to determine that distinction. So, and then there are uh, circumstances associated with that. So for the record, as a county, Camden County is in the red category of viral transmission. In order for um, uh, us to move out of that particular area of transmission, um, we would have to have less than 100 cases per 100,000, and we are currently at 170 cases over the last seven days. So as a county, we are red, and this is the, the data that's helping to inform that. Ooh. Associated with that distinction, there are specific mitigation strategies. As a region, so that region, including Burlington County, Camden County, Gloucester County, and Salem County, we are yellow. So as a region, we are yellow, but as a county, we are in the high transmission red category. So the mitigation strategies related to all schools is universal and correct usage of masks is required with the implementation of other key strategies, including hand washing, respiratory etiquette, cleaning and maintaining of health facilities, contact tracing, preferred diagnostic testing in combination with quarantine and isolation. Uh, K-12 schools open for full uh, in-person instruction, physical distancing of six feet or more to the greatest extent possible. This is a requirement under the high transmission rate. There is a uh, expectation that schools are leveraging their capacity in order to be able to maintain the six foot social distancing in addition to the other mitigation strategies. So as a district, when we think about where we fall within that continuum of having high transmission within our county and having a standard of using and following the science, which has prevented us from having widespread rampant transmission within our schools, um, it is the opinion of uh, all of our association leaders, our district leaders, our staff, our boards of education to maintain the standard that has helped to uh, uh, keep transmission and spread of this deadly virus low within our school community. So the two primary mitigation strategies that we will continue to incorporate at this point with the understanding that as the guidance changes based on the data and information, we will change. Uh, but for, for uh, today's purposes, the universal use of masks and physical distancing are the two strongest strategies that we have as a layered and measured approach to reducing spread uh, within our schools. Current status of our learning, uh, our modes of learning. We currently have a percentage of students that are participating in full remote. We originally started with 100% of our students in full remote. We have a percentage of our students are participating in the two-day hybrid, as well as a percentage of our students participating in four-day hybrid. Our original goal articulated back in September was to transition as many students as possible back to in-person instruction of some form with our long-term goal to get to full-time in-person instruction. And we're moving in that direction. Uh, you heard, you're going to hear from several leaders based on the items that we're doing in preparation for full-time instruction. So we're gonna hear from our current uh, business administrator in terms of the investments 
um, that we are planning on using to support um, our preparation for full-time in-person instruction. Like I said, during my budget presentation and during um, the discussion of the ESSER funds, um, on the screen is uh, the dollars that we've been allocated by the federal government. Um, and uh, we've seated an ad hoc committee of the board to look at spending the 1.2 million um, on facilities. We have a list of facilities projects, uh, windows projects, and we're looking at some HVAC related items that um, we would like to use that money for, get most bang for our buck. Um, and again, here's the 82,000 for your uh, accelerated learning summer school that we could spend over the next couple of summers and the 45,000 uh, for mental health services. And uh, more will be forthcoming once I get the grant application. Okay. Thank you. Yep. We're now getting ready to hear from our head of facilities, Mr. Higginbotham. Uh, good evening, everybody. Uh, as you can see up on the uh, screen there, uh, our facility considerations. Uh, I'm not gonna go through each individual letter. You can read through them and see that we're following guidelines uh, set forth by the uh, Department of Health. Uh, I wanna talk a little bit about um, recent social distancing assessment uh, that we undertook. Uh, back in the summer, we conducted initial assessments um, and set the rooms up to maintain a six foot uh, space between students. Uh, all the rooms were recently reassessed in late February, early March uh, to establish if we could increase the number of students per room while still maintaining the social distancing guidelines. Uh, in a few instances, we found that we could rearrange the furniture and possibly make room for one or two additional students. Uh, however, the vast majority of rooms are already set up uh, for maximum, maximum occupancy while maintaining the six foot social distancing requirements. Uh, for cleaning and disinfecting protocols. Uh, the district uh, purchased additional COVID related materials with funding provided by the CARES Act. Uh, this included personal protective equipment, cleaning products, uh, MERV 13 filters, uh, hydroxyl generators, and hand sanitizer. Uh, additionally, we purchased uh, clear uh, PETG shields, which is a fancy uh, form of plexiglass. Uh, they were purchased and installed on the students' uh, desks. And throughout the day, uh, school custodial staff utilize uh, electrostatic sprayers and we clean all the high touch areas in the restrooms every 30 minutes. And all the areas throughout the building are clean and disinfected on a nightly basis. For HVAC and ventilation, uh, we're following HVAC guidelines set forth by ASHRAE, that's the American Society of Heating, Refrigeration, Air Conditioning and Heating Engineers. Uh, their recommendations uh, for schools can be found at their website. And I believe there is a link, uh, or if not, I can provide a link in the comments section for their resources. Uh, currently all the district uh, HVAC equipment is monitored daily and we're ensuring that all systems are operational, uh, are operating as designed for building occupancy. And current recommendations are to maintain indoor air quality humidity levels between 40 and 60%. We're meeting those on a daily basis. We've installed high efficiency filters uh, in all compatible units. And additionally, we've increased run times. Uh, uh, typically the building would be, the units would be running during times of building occupancy. So if we've increased the run times to provide uh, more fresh air, more turnovers within the buildings. So uh, typically during the school year, we would turn the air conditioning on six o'clock in the morning. It would turn off at six o'clock at night. Uh, currently we are firing the units up at 12 midnight on uh, Sunday night and they are running till 12 midnight on Friday uh, so that we're getting the maximum amount of air exchanges and uh, increasing fresh air as much as possible within the building. Okay. Thank you, sir. We're now gonna hear from our chief academic officer around the uh, learning schedules. Thank you, Dr. McDowell. Good evening, everyone. I'd like to focus on our current learning schedule um, in terms of where we began in the beginning of the school year and where we are headed. Um, as you are probably well aware, we have uh, prioritized our core instructional areas of science and social studies, um, as well as our math and balanced literacy concepts. Across all of our elementary schools, this means we are focusing on word study, reading workshop, writing workshop, interactive read aloud, 
small group instruction for both guided reading um, and strategy groups that exist for both reading and writing. And our district also prioritized our new SEL curriculum that was designed in a collaborative effort over the summer months. Um, throughout the school year, we have been monitoring instruction, seeking feedback from teachers, and uh, making attempts to adjust our instructional plan accordingly. Um, after feedback from teachers and currently speaking with them, we are seeking in particular to have an increased amount of time for math instruction. Um, we are also seeking to have additional time for guided reading with um, additional support materials for Fox and Pennell for their guided reading um, that before were not offered to students because they just were not available in a digital format. Um, we also know that we have students who are in need of additional support for academic intervention, and we do have an RTI model that allows for that through um, our discussions with teachers that are ongoing currently in preparation for after spring break. We are trying to free up additional time to provide additional support for those students um, who are experiencing high need. Um, one of the models that I think we have all recognized can be extremely effective during this um, time of instructional um, learning is small group instruction. And so by uh, revising our schedules, we are hoping to increase the amount of time that students will be visited in small group um, to both reteach and reinforce skills, as well as um, address any prerequisite skills that might be uh, a challenge for a student at this current time. So uh, prioritizing many of these areas and also allowing for increased time for office hours in the afternoon with a more specific focus on reteaching and reinforcement is what we are have, hoping um, will address the increased needs of students over time. Um, we also want to make sure that we are understanding that throughout all of our learning schedules, we are prioritizing and continuing to prioritize building relationships, building supportive family and student partnerships, um, time management in terms of students, and also coaching students towards greater independence. Uh, so I will now provide a little bit of an overview in terms of how do we approach curriculum instruction in the district. Um, about a year and a half ago, we um, determined that having a, a more concrete instructional um, component for curriculum design would be a benefit to the district. And we um, began the process of designing our curriculum under the Connected Road Action Roadmap or CAR model, which is really at the heart of it are the professional learning communities that exist between teachers, um, all staff members and administrators. Um, during PLC times, um, what, what occurs is um, obviously planning amongst teachers as well as um, an analysis of, of the standards of student data, along with a reflection of teaching practices. With those components in place, we are able to look very closely at formative assessment data, at, at the benchmark assessments that we have throughout the district, and also any anecdotal notes and teacher collaboration across units of study. Why we prioritize this is because this is what moves instruction forward. This is how we address the standards that are set forth by uh, the Department of Education, and so that we can also prioritize um, what is needed in terms of student acceleration. Uh, the PLCs provide a continuum for instructional design for the grade levels that students have um, already um, been through, for the grade levels that they're headed towards. Um, and, you know, we are currently making sure that we can have our vertical articulation across the grade levels in order to be able to ensure that our teachers know where the students have come from and where they're expected to grow. Uh, in particular, uh, the Department of Education, as well as student achievement partners um, who are extremely well aligned because they were the original developers um, aligned with core, Common Core Standards, which as we know, New Jersey um, got on board with and with some slight adjustments adopted their own standards, but they are the foundation for much of the work from the DOE. And these concepts of, um, in particular, literacy and math have very specific um, support materials so that we can understand the prerequisite concepts that are needed, the skill supports that are needed, and how we can prioritize our instruction in these areas um, throughout the remainder of this third trimester and moving forward. So we are basically hoping to maximize instructional decisions, um, accelerate grade level ex expectations and skills um, that's been ongoing throughout the course of this year and will continue throughout the third trimester.
And I want to finally acknowledge the fact that we have been working in a model of gradual release of responsibility for several years now. Um, it is a model that has been fluent in terms of design for curriculum instruction around units of study in reading and writing. Um, it's something that we have also grasped hold of when it comes to our math instruction in, in many ways. And basically what that means is uh, students are in a classroom environment where a teacher is very intentional in their teaching and their design. There's a focused instruction that starts our lesson with a mini lesson. Um, and there is guided instruction on the part of the teachers and students. And then eventually there's both a collaborative portion and an independent learning portion. So we refer to this um, affectionately as the I do, we do, you do model. It's something our teachers are very familiar with and our students are as well um, because of our curriculum design over the course of the years. However, we know that in this climate, it has been increasingly challenging for independent um, independence on the part of students in many ways um, because we are in very different environments and we know that we want to eventually return to a typical school day where students are going to again be in a format where they will receive the same type of instruction with a mini lesson model uh, followed by independent practice throughout the course of the day in that gradual um, release of responsibility model. So in doing so, um, one of the things that we want to do is uh, prioritize this model as our devotion to how we can address student needs uh, to uh, build fluency and concepts, to reinforce those prerequisite skills, to apply new skills and concepts, and more importantly, extend their learning. Um, this uh, model is um, crucial to developing meta metacognitive skills, um, asking and, and discussing reflection questions pertinent to students' learning, and also um, highlights self-regulation. And as we move forward throughout this third trimester, those will be goals that will be uh, further achieved throughout the new uh, design in terms of the instructional day and learning model um, in advance of what we are preparing our students for in September. Thank you. Thank you. Dr. Whitehouse. Thank you, Dr. McDowell. Uh, my name is Beth Whitehouse and I'm the supervisor of special services. I'm going to give a brief overview about special education in Collingswood and social emotional learning at the elementary level um, during the pandemic. Um, so students in special education programs often have highly specialized learning needs and work with multiple professionals in the school system. Um, this requires a lot of coordination on the part of multiple staff members. So from the beginning of our reopening, one of the district's goals for the current school year was to provide as much in-person instruction as possible to maintain the integrity of the student's individualized programming um, and to provide consistency and routine for academic instruction, as well as behavioral and therapeutic intervention. And then for families that chose remote instruction, the teachers, um, child study team and support staff really worked hard to identify new approaches that worked for those students. Um, it's also worth noting for special education that the New Jersey Special Ed Education Code um, requires that smaller class sizes are implemented for self-contained and pull-out replacement services. Um, so these, this allowed us to make these decisions while maintaining the recommended health guidelines. Um, beginning in September, students receiving self-contained services began in attending in-person instruction, um, and they were offered the full amount of the district's in-person instruction um, time by October. Students receiving pull-out replacement services began attending in-person instruction in September by appointment, and then they were offered up to four days of in-person instruction throughout the fall months. Um, so next steps for special ed with the upcoming changes to the district schedule, we'll be able to offer five days of in-person instruction for students receiving um, self-contained and pull-out replacement services. And um, that will start on April, the week of April 19th for self-contained and the week of April 26th for um, students receiving pullout replacement. Um, for social emotional learning, this is something that we've been really proud of this year. Um, and this is part of our Collingswood Strong Initiative. 
we have pr begun providing a range of services at the elementary level for to address students and families um, social and emotional learning and mental health needs. Um, the SEL team presented about these initiatives at the board meeting in December, so I'll just provide a quick overview of some of the services we're providing. Um, in Collingswood, we work from a tiered systems of support model for academic intervention, and we're following the same process for SEL. Um, at the tier one level, which is what all students receive, our work includes the SEL curriculum for our students, um, provision of resources to staff and families, and check-ins with staff and families to support classroom and home-based SEL needs. At the tier two level, um, more focused support is provided to staff, students, and families via consultation, small group counseling, and classroom intervention. And finally, at our most intensive level, level tier three, services become even more specialized and are based on need. Um, and some of these supports include individual counseling and consultation um, and individualized SEL interventions for students. And this includes our um, mental health partnership with Jefferson Health. Thank you, Dr. Whitehouse. So when we talk about um, expanding access, so what we are, uh, what we have previously shared is how we're actually preparing for expanded levels of access. So we talked earlier about uh, the categories being full remote, um, two day hybrid and a four day hybrid for our uh, highest need learners. We are shifting as we move and convert greater numbers of students from full remote back to hybrid we also felt the need to reassess our capacity based on the demand and increase the amount of in-person instruction to students. So we are now proposing and, and, and uh, moving forward with a three-day hybrid. So converting our two-day hybrid students to three days of hybrid instruction and converting our four-day hybrid students to five days of hybrid in-person instruction. And then that's broken down by uh, grade band between elementary and secondary. So for ex the expansion of uh, in-person learning at the elementary level, starting today, um, based on the opt-in process that concluded on March 3rd, uh, we are shifting our students who were previously in a full remote environment to two-day hybrid learners. So that started effective today. And as students are transitioning in by the end of this week, both cohorts would have um, uh, been reintegrated back into school. Effective uh, April 19th, we will be shifting our self-contained classrooms from four days to five days of in-person instruction. Um, starting on April 26th, we will be shifting our two-day hybrid learners to three days of, of, of hybrid in-person instruction on a rotating basis between the blue and gold cohorts uh, adding back into their schedule the Wednesdays, which that Wednesday schedule for elementary would be 9 a.m. to 12 from preschool from 915 to 1215. And the dates for the blue cohort would be April 28th, May 12th, and May 26th. So those children would be operating on a three-day in-person, two-day remote. And on the gold uh, uh, cohort, May 5th, May 19th, and June 9th with pullout replacement services being uh, provided in person on Wednesdays. In addition to shifting the four-day hybrid learners to five-day hybrid learners uh, for families that have already been participating in the four-day-a-week hybrid model based on an existing extreme hardship. The dates and times for uh, secondary um, are similar, but a bit different because the natural break within the year is the marking period and elementary operates on a different uh, marking period schedule than our secondary schools. So starting April 19th in our secondary would be to shift the remote learners uh, who have been fully remote to two day hybrid students. Also shifting our self-contained uh, secondary classrooms from four days to five days of in-person hybrid learning. And then phase four would be uh, April 26th, shifting our two-day hybrid learners to three-day hybrid learners with blue and gold cohort uh, rotating on Wednesdays and shifting the four-day hybrid learners to five-day 
uh, hybrid learners for families that had a pre-existing hardship uh, based on um, uh, a partnership that they've had with their local school. And pull out uh, replacement services would also be offered to our secondary students weekly on those Wednesdays. I think it's also important for us to go back to the consideration groups. When we think about um, the different groups that we are planning for, um, there needs to be an acknowledgement that we have teachers, we have support staff, we have parents and caregivers, and we have students. But I think that it's also important to understand that our teachers and our support staff also are parents who have students um, who attend this district as well. So when we make the statement that we're all in this together, um, the, nothing could be further from the truth. So we want to make sure that we're being mindful of all of the variables and factors that goes into the day-to-day -day decision making. And there's a large group of individuals both in the district and out of the district that are helping to inform that plan. So the district has prided itself on site-based leadership and flexibility. Schools have been using targeted data to reach out directly to the most impacted families in an effort to offer the additional support. This has been taking place since November of 2020. In order to maintain the CDC and Camden County public health guidance for schools, this has been done on a case-by-case -case basis based on enrollment, social distancing requirements, and the severity of family challenge. Each school's process looks different because each school's level of need is variable. If your family is in fact experiencing an extreme hardship, please follow up directly with your building administrator or counselor for additional information. Uh, we are going to hear uh, of how that is manifesting in schools so that you understand what is actually happening on each campus. Mr. Kulak. Thanks, Dr. McDowell. Hi, everyone. Uh, Brian Kulak, Building Administrator over at Tatum, and I'll be representing the elementary leadership team tonight. Uh, and I think there's a couple things uh, not present on the slide I'll start with, and that is uh, number one, the ultimate support for our families comes from our amazing, talented, and exhausted teachers. So I hope that that somehow resonates with folks, uh, that our teachers have done more um, with less and um, have exceeded expectations in what has been an expectationless pandemic. Um, so um, as a proud leader of teachers um, and somebody who used to be at the district level and knows our teachers across the district, I'd be remiss to not talk about them as the number one support for our kids. Uh, the other thing I'll, I'll talk here about, uh, Dr. McDowell just talked about, which are flexibility and access. Um, I don't know that you could argue um, that we have more access to teachers and school leaders than ever before. Uh, and that's largely because um, those school teachers and leaders are willing to do whatever it takes to meet families where they are. Um, I, I would argue that some uh, of you may speak to your child's teacher more than your spouse or your family. Um, and that again is okay with us because that's kind of what we expect. So the, the continuum of services and supports are based on our flexibility, meeting you where you are, and the access to our teachers and our leaders. Um, the other thing too is what you're about to see here represents that which is offered across the district, which represents equality. What is provided through this based on specific child or family needs is what is equity. So if you were confused about those two, which I know um, is hard to sometimes keep straight in your head, those two should help. So the communication uh, at the elementary level is um, far more constant than it is at the secondary level. And I say that as a former high school teacher, it's just part of the daily routine for us to talk to you, Jojo, as you saw, Google Classroom, email, or phone. Um, and so that is part of, uh, I think what we're most proud about is that our teachers are constantly communicating with you. But more importantly, uh, I, especially at Tatum, we have developed trust in our schools in our community whereby families are comfortable in a way they wouldn't have been in a generation before to talk to us about loss and divorce and moving and things that are affecting your children that we need to know about. Once we know that, we spring into action in a way that's based on that need at that time, and that is daily. 
Intervention and referral services is often referred to as I and RS. Uh, and that process, which uh, Dr. Whitehouse talked about a little bit, is tiered. Uh, and what we want to do there is make sure that the supports for families are on a sort of pyramid that uh, at the top of which is our IEP students, which we are bound by law to provide certain services for by minutes. Our 504 students who are in the general ed population but get accommodations based on a diagnosis from a doctor. And then those students who may be struggling academically, behaviorally, or emotionally. Um, and each building has a team in place that meets regularly, usually between five and six weeks to discuss those children, come up with interventions, and then share those interventions with you, which again reflects back to the first bullet about conflict communication. Academic support is a crucial component of elementary learning. Um, my son is an elementary student and is, is in it. So I, I know what I speak uh, in that regard. And that continues uh, the small group sessions before school, during school, and after school through our outstanding academic support teachers, uh, often who are coming to leaders with, hey, can I at this time to make more room for children to need academic support as opposed to trying to find less. So any minutes they can cram into the schedule to meet with kids, oftentimes in hallways, in stairwells, and in places that are not necessarily in the classroom for distancing purposes, they will do, that will continue. And the biggest part of that is to make sure that children are attending office hours when those are offered. Uh, I couldn't be more proud of the, the mental health counseling program and of our community, many of whom are here tonight who voted for this. Mental health was not discussed for years, uh, for forever really, um, until recently, and now it has become a priority. So one of the tiered interventions we have is through the outstanding work of Kristen Alexi and her team, uh, led by Dr. Whitehouse. So when we or a family sees the need for counseling in small group, or individual, um, we have a process for referral through the teachers and the leaders to get kids those um, supports. There's also a Google Classroom that was uh, created by Ms. Alexi so that everybody has access to everything they need from a mental health and counseling standpoint, as long as they're willing to accept that mental health and counseling is necessary in their lives. We also have an outstanding community liaison. I know Mr. Jenna will probably talk about his later. Um, and what she does is at our um, request, she will meet families uh, at their homes or wherever um, when we are struggling to get them to come to school uh, on time at all or to get the services that could be provided by Ms. Alexi or anybody in our district. Um, so our community liaison is used, at least especially by me, uh, ad nauseum, and she is outstanding and gets things, that, uh, gets things done that we need done. The other thing that we do, uh, which is very challenging for us and for you all, uh, is working with pods that can sometimes be in somebody's home, uh, the learning centers at places like the Perkins Center and LLA, and then unique family circumstances where folks are going back and forth between blended families uh, on certain days. Um, we have adjusted schedules from blue to gold cohorts to make sure that families are together when they're supposed to be together and with us when they're supposed to be with us. Um, and I'll even go a step further to talk about uh, the work with teachers who have offered to go to children's homes and drop stuff off, whether it be food or materials. I had a teacher who offered to walk somebody home in the rain because his grandmother was afraid to drive to Tatum to pick them up. Um, these are things that no one talks about and doesn't end up on uh, social media sites, but are part of the supports that we do every day. Um, and we're gonna continue to do as long as folks are happy and safe in their pods and learning centers, we will meet them where they are. And then again, the SEL curriculum, uh, SEL for those of you who may not know is social emotional learning, which again was often whispered about, but not necessarily spoken about out loud until recently. Uh, and your child has SEL through uh, your PE teacher this week. And the, the zones of regulation are uh, is a mental health check in every day with our teachers based on colors and feelings. So our kids are not only being able to express how they feel with their teachers, and why they feel that way, but we are normalizing talking about how we feel and why we feel that way, which again, for people of a certain generation like mine, is not part of the deal in school. So again, the, uh, the supports are across the board. How we provide them are based on um, specific needs. And I think that we have done as best as we can with all our families and we'll continue to do that regardless of the learning model moving forward. Thanks. Thank you, sir. Um, there has also been discussion uh, within our community about um, our middle school. Uh, our middle school currently uh, is the largest uh, uh, student population participating in in-person instruction. 
Uh, and, and we believe it's important to share the factors that actually led us to, to that point. Um, and we're gonna hear from Dr. McMullen. Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. My name is Jack McMullen, principal of Collingswood Middle School. And also I'd like to take this opportunity to introduce and thank one of our CMS main office secretaries, the awesome Miss Katie Seely, who's gonna present with me tonight as well, um, to help communicate the process that we use to provide in-person learning uh, to our middle school students. I know Mrs. Seely's name will be familiar to a lot of our middle school parents if you've called looking for a Google Classroom access code, had a situation with a Chromebook, all those things. So I thank Mrs. Seely for taking the time this evening. I'd also like to start though and, and thank the parents. Uh, our parents have been awesome in the way that they've supported their children through this. They've supported our staff. They've offered us grace and patience as we navigate one of the most challenging times that I can recall in a 41 year career in education. This is unprecedented times. And as I say, we are successful because we're doing this together. So I thank you. Uh, I'd also would be remiss if I did not acknowledge the incredible teachers and the jobs that they are doing, navigating not only in-person and remote students, and they do that, they say, um, with grace and patience as well. So uh, that and an acknowledgement to the, the district leadership, um, uh, Collingswood, as somebody who has a daughter who teaches in another state and a sister who teaches in another district, um, we are we are making some good, steady progress. I know it's difficult when we're living through that to see that because sometimes things are a little too close to our face to get a good perspective. But I wanted to uh, offer at least some words of encouragement as we, we move forward. So how, does our pro so how does our process at CMS work? So all current remote students uh, always have the option, and this was referenced at the plan in the beginning of our presentation, the beginning of every marking period at the secondary level, there's always been the option to return for in-person learning. Uh, for us, that next date, that instruction will begin, will be April 19th, where we will increase our numbers once again. For planning and preparation purposes, families are asked to complete the form that was sent to them to indicate the intent to return to in-person learning. It's very, very important that you return that information to us by Friday, the March 19th due date, so we can again look at our numbers, look at our capacities and uh, do all that we can do. And we are currently researching our procedures to be able to honor all requests for in-person learning while maintaining our health and safety requirements that you heard about earlier. Uh, folks who have requested four-day in-person learning will process them on a case-by-case -case basis and has has been referenced, we are really prioritizing our four-day request presently for our students who have the highest need, going through INRS processes, going through um, situations that we know of and been informed of. Uh, in all cases, parents will receive a confirmation from their school as far as the status of that request. So at this point, I'm going to introduce Mrs. Seely to go a little further in depth with the actual process. Thank you, Dr. McMillan. Um, so what are the steps in the process? When a student returns to in-person learning, we have to make sure that we have enough space for them. Um, I am a proud C uh, Collingswood graduate. I went through elementary school, middle school, and high school. And as happy as I am to be home, the buildings have not changed since I was in school. <laughs> but they're still filled with love, it's just that, you know, they're a little older. So currently at the, at the middle school level for the third marking period, our blue group has 144 students in hybrid and our gold core cohort has 110 students in hybrid. That does not count the 
44 students that are already in our blue gold who come four days a week. Um, any number of additional students returning for each cohort for the fourth marking period is determined by the availability and space with, left within the classroom. Um, within the classroom, you have your teachers, you have your instructional assistants, um, you have your push-in teachers, and you have your students. In some cases, that is an awful lot of people. Um, when a student returns to in-person learning at the secondary level, it doesn't just affect that one student. It affects every student in every classroom they enter. Most of our CMS parents know that students have eight different classes with eight different groups of kids, and each in-person student has another eight classes with eight different groups of kids. So it really is a true ripple effect with regards to any sort of exposure. Yeah. <clears throat> we um, review each returning student's schedule to make sure that we are adhering to the current CDC COVID-19 guidelines. So in review, our first step after collecting the Google form that is sent that was sent out on March 12th, which is due to us by March 19th. Uh, we check the number of students wishing to return to in-person learning in our hybrid schedule. We make sure that we have enough space in the building for students and staff to socially distance. Then our second step is to assess each class and make sure we don't have any classroom space issues for health and safety purposes for our returning hybrid students. Only after that can we see if we have physical space to bring any student back in four days a week. Students who fit in the predetermined groups that were given at the very beginning of the school year are the first groups eligible to return four days a week. These include our pull-out resource students, our uh, English as a second language learners, students with IEPs, and then students who have um, been identified as having the most extreme need and hardships. The final step is to refer to our four day request file to see if we have available space for those students whose parents wish for them to return to four days. We've recorded each request um, that was either sent to myself, Dr. McMullen, or our guidance counselors. Also, finally, please remember we love our students and we would like nothing more than to have everybody back and to return to normal but we have to work within the constraints of our classroom capacities and the health and safety guidelines that are in place. Everyone in and out of our buildings is working hard to ensure the health and safety of our students. We know this is hard. We feel it too. Remember that most of our staff are not only teachers, but fellow parents and your neighbors. We thank you for your continuing work and partnership with us and we appreciate the support that you've extended to the school community. Sorry about that. Uh, Mr. Jenna. Good evening, everyone. I'm Matt Jenna. I'm the high school principal. Um, wanted to talk about the high school process um, in a lot of ways, um, very similar to um, what Dr. McMullen and Ms. Seeley described as far as our process and procedures for incorporating students. However, at the high school, we are in a different situation um, than our colleagues at the middle school and elementary schools in that we do have a lower percentage of our um, students attending in-person uh, classes at this time. So I wanted to speak a little bit about that tonight and um, what, we're, what we're doing right now. Um, our, our focal point at the high school is to try to incorporate more in-person in students. Um, so I could talk about what we're doing on a number of levels. Um, first, our administration counselors, uh, child study team teachers, our family liaison, as uh, Mr. Kulak mentioned, um, our sports, support staff, you know, pretty much our entire staff, we're collaborating on identifying students um, who Maybe struggling with remote learning that we feel would really benefit um, from coming in for, for in-person classes um, and we're directly contacting those families by reaching out to them uh, discussing uh, two or even four day 
um, in-person opportunities at this time. Um, again, also because our, our numbers are lower as far as percentages of in-person students, um, we've also, we also put out to um, our, our high school families and parents uh, the, opportunity okay. to be, the opportunity to begin um, in-person learning this week, actually. Uh, we did see some, some new faces in the building uh, this morning, which was, which was great to see. Um, and then uh, third, um, as um, Dr. McMullen and Ms. Seeley mentioned, we do have the new uh, marking period coming up um, at the high school after spring break. And in a similar fashion, the middle school, we're asking our high school families, um, if not interested in, in starting hybrid learning now, um, to, to contact us by this Friday, March 19th, um, so that we can um, track the request for, you, for your child to begin in-person learning uh, for the fourth, fourth marking period. And we're keeping track of those uh, requests. And um, uh, if space continues to remain available, uh, we, we certainly may be able to offer um, students not only two day, but additional days up to four days um, of in-person instruction um, at, the, at the high school. Um, again, we, we, our situation is a little bit different. We are looking for more, uh, more students to come in. Uh, we are seeing that the students who are coming in are, are finding it to be beneficial in a number of uh, ways. Um, you know, just getting into the routine of getting up, getting ready, um, uh, getting out of the house, com coming into the school building. Um, students are finding that to, to be helpful as far as kind of feeling a little more normal again after, you know, many of us have spent a lot of time in our homes over the last years, uh, last year. Um, so students are finding that process of just getting back to that routine beneficial. Um, they're seeing an academic benefit as well. Um, you know, we're talking to the kids that are, that are in the building. They feel like they're able to concentrate um, and, and get more work done when they're at school, um, away from some of the uh, distractions, um, you know, temptations that might be you know, at home as far as being distracted from schoolwork. Um, and then there's the social benefit. Um, while we do not have a, a large number of students in the building now, there are certainly some students, um, our staff is there. So the students that are coming in are finding that they're getting some more social interactions that, um, you know, they may have been missing over, over the last year. And uh, you know, our, our hope is to continue to, to build that, that progress and momentum as we gain you know, more and more uh, uh, students back into the building, um, that social element will continue to, to increase, um, which I know is, is beneficial to the students and, and, um, and something that they enjoy. Um, and just a couple of uh, points here about some of the additional support that we've been offering for students. Um, uh, teachers are available every every afternoon, every school afternoon for office hours. Um, many times they're done remotely, but they can also be done in person. Um, we also have a program at the high school for students who need to catch up on uh, attendance time, whether that's due to lateness or absences. Um, we call it late today, stay today. Um, in a typical school year, we're doing that in person in, in the building, uh, but now we've set up a virtual late today, stay today, where students can essentially log in in the afternoon after classes. Um, and use that as essentially a, an after school study hall um, to get some work done. But then we're also giving them attendance credit, uh, make up credit for uh, time that they may have missed. Um, and finally, we have also uh, through our, our Title I grant, we were able to establish an after hours uh, tutoring program uh, through which students can get either one to one or small group tutoring by uh, teachers of various content areas. And that is available, uh, you know, depending on the, the tutor availability, but that's available after school hours. So after 2.30 p.m. in the late afternoons, um, sometimes in the evening and sometimes even on the weekends, the teachers um, are making themselves available um, for those uh, tutoring sessions. And actually I should, should have mentioned also counseling sessions um, is also part of that, uh, that grant that we, that we have so that um, students can get additional time with their, with their counselor. Um, beyond school hours if they if they'd like to as well. Thank you, sir. So the question of how do I get involved and how do I engage? Per the uh, the superintendent's entry plan that was distributed throughout the school community on February 1st, uh, there's a few ways. Um, uh, one would be through uh, school site visits where uh, we will be bringing teams of leaders to every school uh, to do classroom walkthroughs, meeting with the staff, meeting with the students, but more specifically, opportunities to meet with our parents and our caregivers um, and have a, um, 
school specific conversation. We are strongly encouraging for there to be conversations to each other rather than conversations at each other. And this is one way in order to be able to do that in a more intimate setting where questions can be asked, ideas can be generated and solutions can be co-constructed. Uh, we're all in this together and it's gonna take all of us coming together in order to make sure that we come out on the other side better than before. Um, in addition, meeting requests, we have uh, for the last six weeks been meeting with individuals as well as groups at their, at their request. We will continue to make ourselves available to engage um, in uh, uh, solution-based discourse uh, through, throughout. In addition to uh, PTA-sponsored events, uh, leadership team, we will be meeting with all of our PTA presidents and vice presidents or their designees this week um, in order to gain uh, their feedback and then to also request that they host a community forum through the PTA for us to have more ongoing discussion so that we can collect more valuable feedback. So in the coming weeks, there'll be lots of discussion driven by public health guidance, which uh, is in flux. And as public health guidance changes, so shall we. Department of Education guidance, school board policies, and most importantly, educator and community feedback. There has been an insurmountable loss due to COVID-19 and it is vital um, that we continue to address this as a community. National dialogue is important, but local concerns and needs have to drive our focus and ultimately our decision-making process. As, as we are living in a crisis, it's also important to not look at this as a competition. We don't compare ourselves with other entities. Um, we are using information based on what we believe to be uh, in the best interest of our students um, here. So our goal ultimately is to create an equitable and effective teaching and learning environment that utilizes evidence-based policies and practices that will allow us to rethink the way in which school happens for not just our students, but also our educators. Now, the question that is on the hearts and minds of probably everyone on this call, and that is, will we be fully reopening schools this year? This is a question mark based on the current guidance, and I'm going to emphasize the word current, um, it is highly unlikely unless something changes that we will be in a position to fully reopen schools. We do believe that we can continue to expand and increase the number of students participating with in-person instruction, but we do have some goals related to reopening. One is establishing new norms. We have some students that have not physically been in a school building for, for almost a year. It'll be extremely important for us to reestablish those critical connections between students, their teachers, and their schools. We also need to keep in mind that there will be gaps that are presented um, uh, 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 by students and making sure that we are preparing for our summer learning. Um, we are uh, in a positive position where we will have additional funds to help support that work. Uh, for the next several years, so we, we will be taking advantage of that. We also have to make sure that we are refining our protocols because based on the guidance that we have been receiving, some form of mitigation strategies will be incorporated um, in the fall and probably for the foreseeable future until something pretty significant changes within our communities and within our country as it relates to the virus. Uh, but we believe that we can get closer to our goal of being fully um, uh, uh, in-person instruction if we continue to work together, if we continue to follow the science and continue to hold to the standard that has kept everyone safe for the last year. That concludes um, this portion of the school reopening presentation. Thank you, uh, Dr. McDowell, and to all of the, the school leaders who took the time um, to contribute to that um, very comprehensive presentation. Uh, we, we really do appreciate it. Uh, one quick question that, or clarifying question that I had for Dr. McDowell before I wanted to make a brief statement before we move on to the next section. At the very beginning of the presentation, you mentioned that the next survey with more um, data would be coming out when, do you have a ballpark for when families could expect 
that and and anything having to do with the the next um the next phase of of a plan i don't know if that would be your 90 day plan or if it would be the september plan i'm not sure what you would how you would frame that but questioning the when families can expect that well we're we're looking to um so we have a few natural entry points in terms of expanding of services mm -hmm. uh, so uh, families should expect before the end of april for us to have a more robust data collection instrument. Um, it is. It will be in development uh, and we will be leveraging the feedback that we receive over the next several weeks leading up to spring break um, in order to refine the questions, the data, and hopefully the easement of guidance that we receive every Thursday from our public health officials. Thank you very much for clarifying that. Um, so, like I just said, before we move on, I just wanted to take a few minutes to reiterate uh, some points on behalf of the board. Uh, first, we fully support the district's plan for expanding in-person instruction this school year with as many students as possible while following the New Jersey Department of Health and CDC guidelines. Our priority has and will continue to be to get our students back to in-person instruction as soon as we are able based on the public health criteria that, we, that was outlined this evening. As Dr. McDowell noted tonight, he and his leadership team are actively working on a plan for a return to full in-person instruction in September. That is the district and board's shared goal. However, as the last 12 months have very clearly demonstrated, it would be irresponsible for the district to not have multiple contingency plans in place as well. That does not mean that we're not planning for anything less than a full uh, return in September. It means that all of us need to continue to remain uh, flexible with an eye towards the, the guidance. Um, myself, most of the, my fellow board members and even our, um, our superintendent have children in this district, ranging from pre-K to uh, high school seniors. We know the tremendous toll that this pandemic has taken on our community because we're living through it with you. Um, we know the struggle, some of us very well, the struggle of trying to work and help our elementary aged kid on Zoom simultaneously, of worrying that our middle school and high school kids are keeping up with the work, are uh, getting everything that they need, um, the, the back and forth about whether it's okay for them to have their camera on or not. We are going through all of these exact same uh, conversations with you, of uh, worrying that our kids are getting what they need and if they're not trying desperately to find the additional supports that, that they do need when we can, sharing in their disappointments and what they have missed over this past year and talking with them about the uncertainty and anxiety of these last 12 months to we, we have loved ones and friends who have lost their jobs, who are suffering from housing and food insecurity. And sadly, we know more families than we wish that we knew who are recovering or in the process of recovering from the trauma of contracting and recovering from COVID-19 and some who are still grieving the loss of loved ones. To say that this is a hard time is a massive understatement. And we're all struggling to do the very best we can with this very difficult situation. And we cannot wait for when this is over and for when our kids can return to some sense of normalcy. And when it does come, we want to assure you that we believe, the school board believes that our schools will be ready and fully prepared to welcome your children back uh, because we are planning for it right now. And I hope that that can give some folks on this call tonight some peace of mind that there is a lot of thought and preparation that is going into this that we absolutely hear you when you say that you're at, you're at the end of your rope because we're all feeling it too. Um, and we are, we are really trying, we are, we are very excited for the day when the guidance tells us that uh, we can ease restrictions and that we can reopen schools more fully. With all of that said, uh, it is time to move to section seven, which is our first uh, opportunity for public comment. Uh, I've got some directions for everyone because it's Zoom and it's a little bit different. If you wish to make a statement, please type your name uh, and address into the chat, which is going to be enabled again in just a moment. We disabled it because during um, 
during the presentation, during our regular meetings, people aren't really supposed to be talking during that time. So we disabled it, it's enabled for the public comment. Uh, when your name is called, please unmute yourself to speak and keep your comments to five minutes or less. The purpose for this public comment section is to discuss items listed on the agenda. Additional, more general comments may be made later in the meeting. The public is reminded that attempts to resolve all concerns and complaints should first go, go through excuse me, appropriate staff members and administrators. The intent of public comment is to give the community the opportunity to provide feedback to the board. We will be actively listening and taking notes so that we can take all that is being said into consideration. And there's going to be opportunities to engage in a full dialogue, as Dr. McDowell just said, with both himself and board members in the weeks to come during the individual um, school focus groups and PTA meetings. So with that being said, give me a second here to bring up the chat so that I can see the order of folks' names and uh, we can get started. Okay. Jen Rossi's first, I think. Thank you very much. <laughs> so you see where the there's a lot in the beginning. Of yeah, so yeah, yeah, yeah. I think she's the first people. one. I think. All right. So yes, Jen Rossi. Hello, Jen Rossi, one one four East Palmer Avenue. Actually, Iris Rossi, grade three, would like to speak. Thank you. <laughs> My name is Iris Rossi. I go to Mark Novi School, Collingswood. Thank you for keeping kids virtual or hybrid if they want to. Because doctors don't think the vaccine is safe for kids yet, if all kids go back to school full time, they could catch COVID easier, or which would be bad for a kid like me because I have psoriasis. Most common illnesses are worse for me, so COVID would probably be bad too. I like learning remote and it helps me feel safe. In conclusion, thank you for letting us sit to it's hybrid or virtual because uh, for kids with psoriasis, COVID would be bad to get. Thank you for your attention. Yeah. And uh, uh, thank you to my teachers for helping me learn and keep me safe. Very much, Iris. Uh, next is Jacob Lehman. Hi, Jake Lehman, uh, 701 Linwood Avenue. Uh, so, Dr. McDowell, we've spent an hour and 20 minutes talking about process, and I want to talk a, bit, a little bit about results. Um, you started in this district February 1st, so you've been here about 45 days, and back um, on the 23rd of February, you gave you were kind enough to give a town hall meeting um, where you answered questions from parents. And, and at that meeting, um, just kind of like tonight, you talked about how you believe that the best place for kids to be is in school. Talked about how you're committed to returning as quickly as possible. And I don't know if you recall, but I asked you about the profound negative impact that hybrid and remote learning has on kids, particularly little kids and on families. And you kind of agreed with me about that. And you made reference to that tonight, as did uh, Ms. Caden. And you understood that, that, and you understood that every day mattered. Uh, and that was driving you, and again, you said it tonight, to move as quickly as you could um, to return to um, as much in-person instruction as possible. And you also acknowledged how patient the parents in this district have been, and you asked for more patience. So now we're here uh, about 45 days into your tenure and last Friday you put out a plan. And I, this is really just a math question. It's a results question. What you're proposing to do is you're gonna take away in-person learning the week after spring break. So you're taking away two four hour in-person days for a given student. And then what you're proposing to add for your alternating Wednesday system, at least as far as that calendar uh, goes, is three three-hour uh, in-person Wednesdays for any given student, whether they're in blue or gold cohort. So effectively, what you've been able to accomplish up to this point is you're adding a net of one hour of in-person instruction for an average student that's not in that special needs context. I, I mean, I went to Collingswood Public Schools, Oakland Public Schools, so I'm sure my math's right. I know that anybody wouldn't contest that my math's right on that point. Um, you have any reason to disagree with that? 
Um, Mr. Lehman, I can understand that um, from last month and the town forum that you're used to the, the back and forth with questions, but we are going to be actively listening and taking notes so that we can more- uh, well, Okay, I'll, I'll phrase my questions. statement as a question and you can choose not to respond to it if you want to. The, the second point that, that, I, that I, I'm gonna make and I'll phrase that as a question as well. And again, you can choose not to respond to it. Um, is that, you know, we're here, uh, there's a lot of people here tonight. And, you know, you made reference to this and it's, I don't think anybody's gonna dispute it. People feel very strongly about this issue. And you're gonna hear from a lot of people tonight. Um, and I think what you're gonna hear from people is that while they appreciate the discussion around process, what they really care about are results. They care about accountability. They care about communication. They care about transparency and most of all what they want. And Ms. Kane, you made reference to this, but I'd like you know there to be more information about this and for this to be shared. What they really want is a commitment that the goal of this district is a return to full in-person education in September. And then they wanna see a plan for how we're gonna get there. And nobody is, I don't think that anybody is taking the position that you know we understand circumstances can change. We understand that there are things that uh, can change. You know, there could be a resurgence. I, I don't know anything. And I don't think anybody's going to fault you for deviating from a, a plan based on circumstances. But I think what would inspire a lot of confidence uh, amongst the parents in this district is for you to make that commitment that that's the goal and then to share a plan um, that contains within it clear metrics and data for how you're going to uh, reach that goal. And then the last thing I'll say, you know, because I know there's a lot of people that want to speak is, I would hope that, and you made reference to this, tonight, as you listen to people speak, you do it with an open mind. Uh, you're not doing it just because you've made your decision and, you know, you're listening to the public comment that uh, you're required to do by law, but that you do it with humility, with an open mind, uh, and a consideration that, you know, maybe, your plan needs to change. Maybe there's a better way. Um, and perhaps uh, most of all, that the, the people that are important here are the kids. It's not you, it's not me, it's not really any of us. It's the kids in the Collingswood School District. So I just hope that uh, when you hear from folks tonight, you keep that in mind. That's all I have, thank you. Thank you, Mr. Lehman. Uh, Julia Silvesi. Hi, um, good evening. Uh, Julia Silvesi, 410 Highland Avenue, a proud Garfield Elementary School parent. Um, first and foremost, just thank you to all of the educators and staff on the line tonight. Um, we see you and we appreciate you. Uh, and couldn't be doing this without you all. Also, um, welcome, Dr. McDowell. I just want to say this is not an easy time to transition into your role, um, and we're so appreciative. Or I. I'll speak for myself. I am so appreciative that you are um, here tonight um, and with us in Collingswood. Um, and thank you also to our board members for um, holding on to a commitment uh, during this difficult time as well. I also am someone who cares about results, accountability, transparency, and data. Um, I do not believe that we will overcome this hardship with condescension and speaking to one another um, as if we are not going through something tremendously difficult. I can't thank you all enough for what you have been doing for this district. I think that while it is everyone's desire to return to school, I am so uh, relieved to live in a district that is taking uh, science and health of our teachers and our staff and our families and our students first. I'm so glad we got to hear first tonight from a student. Uh, thanks to Iris for speaking and sharing her perspective. While we all wish we were back in person, I'm, I am really glad we are taking this phased approach even though it probably means many more days of tears and frustration. Uh, I wish I could say only on my children's part, but that's probably from me as well. I really look forward to figuring out a robust plan to bring our kids back full-time in September. 
And I know that energy spent doing that is probably going to yield us a lot more than contention around how to close out this year. I believe we are making a lot of the right decisions. And I know that there um, are always folks who are going to have different opinions uh, about how we should be doing things. But I really appreciate that you are all delivering on the commitment we've made to kids and educators during this time. And I would hope that we all tonight can speak from our own perspectives and speak with the humility and the grace that we are asking our educators and our board to speak with as well. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Solvacy. Uh, Dave Lauer. Yeah, Dave Lauer, uh, 413 Virginia Ave. Um, and I, I agree with a lot of what's been said to a certain extent. I wanna thank everyone, you know, and especially the teachers and staff. These are really crazy circumstances and I understand that. Um, I appreciate all the work that has been done and that we as a district are trying and attempting to follow the science in reopening schools. I believe in science. I pulled my daughter out of school before it even closed last year. I was a full supporter of going to remote and then eventually to hybrid. Um, but the science is clear and it has changed over the past few months. And I think that's really important to understand. We know a lot more now than we did six months or a year ago. That's why other local districts are reopening for full in-person instruction because the science supports that. Every day matters, I agree. That was said uh, by Jacob earlier, I totally agree. Opening schools now is as much of an emergency as closing schools was last year. Closing schools does not change COVID transmission dynamics in a community. If you want to reduce community spread, restricting in-person instruction does not do that. France, Spain, Switzerland, Belgium, Wisconsin, Florida, uh, Texas have all demonstrated K through 12 schools, but especially elementary schools can remain fully open and safely, even as other variants become dominant. Children are at minimal risk. Teachers are at no higher risk than other professions. This science is very straightforward very clear, and certainly as teachers get vaccinated, it's even better. Recent research has shown that there are greater risks to life expectancy with schools closed versus staying open. Other local school districts such as Haddonfield and Haddon Township have looked at the same federal and state guidance and are reopening. There's no benefit to six feet of social distancing. Communities using three feet saw no difference. Wisconsin studies that the CDC relied on showed this clearly. There's no need for hygiene theater. We don't prevent COVID with hand sanitizer or cleaning surfaces. Schools don't need to be closed a day a week for cleaning. It doesn't make any sense. This is a respiratory illness. School reopening should be the most important item on the Board of Education agenda every single meeting. It's kind of crazy. It took an hour, 40 minutes to get to the question of schools fully reopening when you, Dr. McDowell, acknowledged as you went into that slide that this is why everybody is here. There should be the same level of urgency right now to reopen schools as there was last year when they were closed. I think that it's so important to adapt as science changes and as we learn, we did the right thing by closing, we've done the right thing by being in hybrid, but we have learned now that we can reopen safely and that teachers are not at risk, students are not at risk, and that students do not spread COVID from schools to adults. It goes the other way around. There's community spread. It goes from adults to children. I think it is so critically important to stay on top of the science, please to be uh, adaptive as conditions change and to understand that we might be wrong with our current reopening plan and we need to get much more aggressive like other school districts are doing in this county, in this state and around the world. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Lauer. John Flippin. Um, hi, thanks. My name is John Flibbett. Um, I just kicked something. Uh, I live at 514 Park Ave. I have two children in the district who are in elementary school at Tatum. Uh, I'm also a pediatrician and a, a newborn intensivist uh, who has worked throughout this pandemic. Um, I agree with many of the comments um, that have been said, and I do appreciate the principles of the plan that were presented tonight, which are rooted um, in CDC guidelines. I think that one of the difficulties is, you know, as a parent, 
I um, fully have the expectation that I think many parents do, which is that the school district will be open for five days of in-person education in September. Um, barring, of course, unexpected things that happen. And as we have seen over the course of the past year, um, this is uh, a constantly evolving situation. So I acknowledge that while that is the expectation, I appreciate the responsibility that goes with having to have alternatives in place. Um, with that said, <clears throat> as somebody uh, who professionally is engaged in writing guidelines and applying guidelines, I understand the seeming restriction at times with some of these things. But I also think it's important to say that guidelines are written with a degree of latitude um, that is afforded for local application. And in the past, I have heard members of this leadership team say that um, there's hesitation around taking latitude uh, because this is not your area of interest or sorry, interest is the wrong word, area of expertise. Um, and I totally get that. All that stuff at the beginning with the ESR discussion and like the funding, I have no idea what that was about. And I would not wanna make decisions related to that. And I trust that you guys as educational professionals are capable of doing that. Um, but I think that what I wanna make clear is that I have uh, expertise and I have friends with expertise who have children in this district who are making themselves available to this community and to your leadership group to help interpret guidelines and make reasonable judgments around when those things might afford more freedoms. Um, because I get that it must be really um, tenuous to feel like you have to do that. And so I wanna make that uh, an open offer and we are available to you at any point. And I have a really great group of um, people with mixed expertise from adult medicine to three board certified pediatricians, mental health experts, and all of these people have children in this community and are eager to see um, your success, which will be the reopening of these schools fully. Um, and so <clears throat> the last thing that I wanna say is that Many of the issues related to uh, reopening seem to relate to space. And so I would hope that there are sort of creative thoughts about how to expand that space, especially as the weather becomes more um, available uh, and make that more feasible. So, you know, restaurants have put tents on their grounds. Like, is that something that's being considered for these kids to be able to get them in person again? And these are the sort of creative things that I hope um, are being considered. So I hope, I also hope that you'll accept that offer. And lastly, I think that, you know, the other constituency here is the teachers. And I realize that they have um, done an enormous amount of work. I think that, um, you know, there must be some, or I have to imagine that there's some hesitation about the notion of having to be back in a classroom with many kids. And I can tell you that going to work last March when there was no vaccine, um, I was scared. And I think that, um, you know, there's a lot more that we know more about this. And so if another opportunity for this group to help is to meet with teachers and talk about what it's been like uh, working every day through this, and some of this group are adult practitioners who took care of incredibly sick COVID patients, um, what we have become accustomed to is really not recognizing the value that masking and other things um, affords in terms of mitigating transmission, which has really not happened in the hospital settings uh, that I have practiced in. So I think that extra 50 seconds, I'll stop there, Reagan. Thank you, Dr. Corbett. Uh, Gretchen Collecting. Can you hear me? Yes. Okay. Uh, thank you uh, to the board for all your volunteer hours uh, and to all of our staff. Um, administrators, uh, teachers, uh, support staff, um, everyone um, through helping us as a community all through this. I, I, I wanna keep this short. I wanna mention three things. Um, I support the board and administration is putting out uh, the uh, detailed timeline uh, that I feel uh, you, you started. And um, I think you will continue to help us to understand uh, what's coming forward. Um, I also wanna support the board uh, looking forward uh, with a return plan while still very much following the state and county guidelines that are set forth for the health uh, and safety of our community. Um, I don't want pressure uh, coming from others um, to 
and I, I'm not talking about Dr. Philippi. Um, uh, certainly, uh, I just follow following uh, the guidelines and and going forward. Um, and lastly, um, there has been some grumblings in the community, not from the board at all. But um, I just wanted to uh, support that the the high school and middle school is for use for the high school and middle school students as they return and they come back. Um, and again, I thank you all for uh, all that you're doing um, and uh, moving us forward. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Kalecki. Uh, Tim Farrow. Thank you, Reagan. And good evening, everyone. It's, it's nice to see some familiar faces. Uh, Beth Ann, I particularly want to say hi to you. I haven't seen you in, in years at this point. Um, so it's been nice to see you and hear your voice. I'd like to start by doing the same thing, thanking all of our teachers and administrators for all of their tremendous efforts over the last year and a half we've been dealing with this. I want to make it extremely clear that while I've already publicly, I'm going to again publicly support the idea of getting our kids back into school as close to a full-time basis as soon as possible, this is not a matter of choosing sides. It's not a matter first of choosing sides between students and teachers. I love and support teachers. and I've been a tremendous supporter of theirs all my life. I'm a son of a lifelong teacher and administrator, a president of a union who I struggled with the, her struggles over the years when she was fighting strikes and dealing with the tremendous stress of heading a teacher's union. I have brothers, I have family members that are teachers and currently heads of unions. So to say that there's one side in support of teachers and unions and one side that does not is absolutely untrue and unnecessary and unnecessarily dividing us. A lot of you know that I was on the board for a few years. It's been a while now. And it's been a while since five years ago, we had a, what now is a relatively, I would say extremely small crisis, but at the time, a huge crisis our, our district was dealing with involving our administrators and actions that were taken. When that crisis happened, I did everything in my power as a board member, spending time during the course of trials I was in the middle of conducting, emailing all day with the superintendent, other board members, trying to solve that crisis. That's what as board members is our obligation and your duty to do. I know Reagan and all of you have been working extremely hard. I don't want for a second to imply that you have not. But what I want to come across in this message is that the nature of this crisis demands that every second we can put into it go not only into protecting the safety and welfare of our teachers, students, and community members, but at the same time, balancing what this is doing to our kids. That is a crisis of proportions equal to the health and safety crisis. And that's what we're feeling is not being conveyed in the message of the actions that have been taken by the board and Dr. McDowell up to this point. That crisis has to be dealt with for what it is. And that's all we're asking. And we're asking to be a team to cooperate in trying to solve that crisis. Dr. Flippett and his team are perhaps the best equipped to do that. They've extended their hand. Before I did anything publicly, I extended my hand to Dr. McDowell and to the board and my hand's still out there. I want nothing more than to work with the board and the administration to get this to where it needs to be. That means committing to coming back in September. It doesn't mean committing and saying it's a commitment we can't fully make, no. Our own governor said this weeks ago when he announced the vaccination schedule for March 15th for teachers. He was asked directly, what do you think about September? And he didn't even let them finish. He said emphatically, 
emphatically our schools will be back. That's what we want to hear. That's what our students want to hear. That's what our parents want to hear. If something happens in between now and then, what do we do? We do what we did last year. We deal with it. We take the measures necessary. No way are we going to let the protection and safety go by the wayside. I know that. We're not going to let that happen. But that doesn't mean we can't give that commitment. And we can't give that commitment for these students by the end of this year. I don't care if it's for two weeks at the end of the year. I don't want my first grader son to say to me one more time, I don't want to go to school. Why am I going to school? Because that's not the normal for him. And if those kids go through another three months and then a whole summer without that normal being introduced again, we're in for a real danger of losing half the year again last year. So I just implore that we really take this for what it is. And lastly, I'll say this division. I'm sorry, you're, you're five I'm, sorry I'm over my five minutes, Reagan. Thank you. Okay. Thank you. Thank sorry. you very much. Sorry. I was looking. I lost track. Thank That's you. Okay. Emily Ivy. Hi, I'm Emily Ivy. I'm on 216 Redding in Oakland. So um, SEL really caught me off guard this year. Brian Kulak said that it's been whispered about for a couple years. So it's been there. I just didn't know about it. And a lot of parents I talk to still don't know what it is. Um, so I don't want to be caught off guard with the new diversity bill. When do you expect we can get a copy of the revised diversity bill curriculum that is going to teach gender, sexual orientation, and unconscious bias starting in grade kindergarten and up? And can we see a copy of the sample learning activities and resources that the commissioner of education is going to be sending to the school districts? Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Ivy. Uh, Ed Bites. Uh, hi uh, to the board, Dr. Uh, McDowell, any, any teachers that are on, uh, thank you for your service. Uh, just for those of you who don't know me, I'm, I'm Ed Bites. I'm one of the, uh, I've become in the past couple of weeks, one of the more vocal um, folks in town advocating for a faster return to school. Uh, part of that, uh, where I guess becoming my own waking up to this, this issue, uh, and, and I'll admit it got me a little hot under the collar of the last couple of meetings with the, that return to school wasn't, wasn't even on the board. Uh, word agenda. I'm happy to see that it's there now. It is. It is appreciated. I agree with one of the earlier folks that it's, uh, it seems to be taking took a long time to get to tonight. But I'm I'm glad that we I'm glad that we got there. Um, just as a father of a first grader at Zane and a kindergartner who we put into private this year because the idea of remote. I'm sorry, a preschooler. The idea that we put a preschooler into remote seemed absurd to us. Um, just we're living having a living experiment at home and the difference between. Uh, someone who gets to go to school four days a week and somebody who um, spends three days at Zoom. Our uh, child gets very excited on the days he gets to go in um, and he stomps his feet and cries and he's not a he's not a stomper feeder crier. Um, I could have uh, probably prepared something for him to come in and, and read but uh, or had him prepare it himself, but I don't want to expose him to that um, uh, that kind of that kind of embarrassment. It is because um, it's not for him. He doesn't have a good story to tell. Um, I will say that um, guidelines are good. I'm a medical malpractice defense attorney. I work with people who are at the, on the front lines of COVID and I understand um, how scary it is. And I understand why guidelines are important. But one thing I would point out that the, the same guidelines that are being cited talk about having well-defined cohorts, uh, meaning that's what the blue and gold was intended to be. It was groups that went two days and then they would be not uh, in contact with the groups that went the other two days. Somewhere along the line, um, it was recognized that there are kids who are, whether it's because they have an IEP or that they're, they're this extreme hardship um, definition that has not been given a defined criteria to parents or a reason why our request to go four days was denied. Um, my submission to the board is that the people who are in the best position to know if our kids are having an extreme hardship from this are the parents. And that if there's a request for a child to go from two to four in, this, in the interim, um, to honor it. I don't begrudge the parents who get to send their kids four days. I would ask them to think about um, is the six, the benefit that their child is getting is the keeping them six feet away from mine. 
during the day that important to you? If we could bend the cohort intermingling um, to allow kids who, who have what has been defined as extra needs to come in, which again, I'm all in floor of because I want, I want our, you know, I want our ship to sail as quickly in the right direction as possible. I also wanted to limit the number of kids that my, my kids are going back into school with who don't remember what it's like to be in full-time school or close to it. Um, so if we were able to bend the, the rule for, for that, the idea that we can't bend six feet to five feet or five feet to four feet or four feet to three feet um, to give uh, all of the children who want to go back four days the benefit of being able to do it uh, and in the long term five days, um, I find that extremely discouraging. And uh, it's something that I would, again, appreciate the, to stop and think that maybe this strict adherence um, is causing more harm uh, than good. It's like, you know, a lot of things in life I have personal opinions on. Some people disagree with me on, on gun control. I think slavish adherence to the Second Amendment is a danger. Slavish adherence to six feet might be a danger. And I would uh, request that uh, the board consider that. And, and, and Dr. McDowell, thank you. Thank you, Mr. Bates. Uh, Kate Mule. Uh, hi, Kate Mull. Um, can you guys hear me? Yeah. Okay, great. Um, I just wanted to uh, make a quick statement about how the public discussion of these issues have come together. I think in recent weeks, the issues of what we should do with the remaining quarter of the school year have been hotly debated in the court of public opinion. And the public discussion on, on Facebook and letters to the editor in the retrospect, and that's a problem, but not because of the public opinion part of that phrase. The problem is the court part, because court is an adversarial environment where there are two sides, plaintiff, defendant. And in this case, I think the argument has been that, um, that we're really trying to pit the needs of families and kids treated as a monolith versus the district somehow. But in this issue, there are many more sides as our district's leadership has so clearly pointed out here tonight, elementary, middle school and high school teachers, just to name three possible constituencies here, all have really different needs for the remaining quarter of this year. And the one size fits all solution being demanded by some of my fellow parents does not reflect the complex reality on the ground. For instance, from an exposure risk perspective, high school age students are a lot more like adults than they are like kids under 10. So saying all students or all kids are gonna be safe in uh, you know, a smaller uh, you know, footprint, um, it just isn't accurate to the science that we all are trying to quote so heavily tonight. I wanna thank Dr. McDowell and the rest of the district leadership and our school board for their thoughtful and nuanced approach to this challenge. And I hope that as a community, we can move past this binary framing that's being argued by some of my fellow parents. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Mullen. I'm sorry I pronounced your last name wrong. Uh, Lori Kerfoot. All right, sorry about that. I had to get my Zoom up and going. I hope I'm good now. Okay, so hi everybody. Um, thank you for giving us the space to um, comment as a community. I'm a mom of two children, one who is neurodiverse and another who um, transitioned while in school and has social emotional um, needs beyond just average students, both of whom have been home since last March, remote learning. Um, you know, prior to this pandemic, I uh, have done childcare in town, which I've had to give up this year, um, you know, like so many moms uh, to stay and supervise my children. Um, that's a sacrifice that we chose to make not only for the safety of our children, um, but immunocompromised family members, as well as thinking about the teachers in our schools and realizing that if we could as uncomfortable as it is, swing having our children here with us supervising them. That was two less children to uh, raise the risk level for the teachers at the school. Um, the thing that I think we're not dealing with here is that uh, children are extremely resilient. And I will tell you that, not that my kids don't struggle because they do, they're your average kids. They have lots of needs and issues. Um, it is that we as parents need to become flexible in our thinking about the capacity that our children can reach. And when we give them heroes to look up to, and in that I mean ourselves stepping up to say that this is a hard time and we need to rise to the occasion to support our educators who are some of the most incredible human beings I've ever dealt with. Um, we have 
staff members across our district who are 65 and older. We have pregnant teachers who uh, have been showing up to school since the beginning of the year with no option for vaccination until recently. Um, we have staff members who have contracted COVID while being in our buildings, who are still dealing with the effects of that health issue, who are still showing up to work for our children every single day. And I really find it almost depressing that as a parent, the only way you feel your child can succeed is if they're in school four to five days a week. I will tell you that it is hard. Is it my dream in life to be here every day telling my kid 50 times to sit down in front of the computer and to stop fidgeting and to listen to the teacher? No, it's not. And is it challenging? And has it been very difficult for our family? Absolutely. But can I rise to that occasion and be a role model for my children and show them that not only do we value their teachers as potential babysitters or space holders, that we value them as human beings. There are people in this school who are worth so much more than they are being given credit for. And I find it extremely disgusting that we are not seeing that these are human beings. These are people who go home to their children. These are people who are leaving their babies with other people to teach our kids. And hybrid education is an open school building. So I also find that we should be, let's be honest here. Our schools are open. They are open for children. They're open, especially more days for children whose parents literally cannot teach them because they have such high needs. So when we start saying that I want my kid to go four days and why can a kid with special needs go four days, I really need us to look in the mirror about what that says about ourselves and what it means to be a hero that a child can look up to. So I just really want us to keep our focus that Children are resilient. Our framing of this time is what our children will see. If we say, this time is horrible, you not being in school is terrible, remote learning is awful, that is what our children believe. If we say, this is really hard, I know you miss these things, then I think that we are really framing it as something where we are learning about what it means to be a community. And like the Borman just said about high school, there's a different dynamic in our high schools than there is in elementary schools. And I think that we really need to be paying attention to all the different aspects of what's going on. And the doctor being willing to give feedback is wonderful, but a teacher is not a doctor. A teacher is not a nurse. These are teachers. They're there to teach children. And this is the best way to keep them safe. So that's it. Thank you, Ms. Kirkland. Holly Capasso Harris. Hi, my name is Holly Capasso Harris and I live at 6 Garfield Avenue in Collingswood. And my family and I wanted to thank the board and superintendent for their hard work in leading us through this pandemic. And we appreciate the clearly laid out plan that you presented tonight. Uh, we support the district's strict reliance on state and federal guidelines while we're still in the midst of a pandemic. In Camden County, 122 people died last month and cases are four times higher now than they were when hybrid learning started in October. It's projected that everyone will be vaccinated and have immunity by the summer and by then cases should decrease. There's, I don't think there's any reason to relax guidelines between now and then when days and weeks can matter for exponential transmission of a virus. I hope that the board and superintendent will continue to base their decisions on guidance from experts and not on cherry picked data or the plans of other school districts. Thanks. Thank you, Ms. Capasso Harris, or Dr. Capasso Harris, I should say. Uh, Thank you. Bye. Oh, sorry, Reagan, I think you need to repeat again. You got oh. up there. Sorry about that. Stu Weimer. Sorry, As Reagan knows I have broken ears and I wasn't sure you said my name. Um, I'm Stu Weimer. I'm at 728 Merrick Weimer. Uh, I have a daughter who goes to the high school. Um, I'm in education. My wife is education in education. So we're experiencing this uh, from all sides. I want to uh, echo some of the more recent comments and thank the Board of Education, the superintendent for the hard work, what I think is very uh, 
evidence-based rational plan. I want to welcome uh, Dr. McDowell to the district. I think you're doing an excellent job and um, very open to the community and I look forward to working with you in the future. Uh, I want to echo the point that's made about the resiliency of children. Um, there are obviously a lot of mental health crises being experienced across this country, across the globe right now, not just by children, but by adults. And as a social scientist, I can tell you that it's very difficult to tease out the causal uh, power of any individual variable. Um, children would be suffering um, all sorts of mental health problems, regardless of whether they were in school or not, because people around them are dying, because their parents are at home all the time and can't go to work, because they're suffering all sorts of economic problems. So school is just one part of that. And I wonder and challenge the idea that going back five days full time is somehow a magic bullet. Um, I don't think it is. Um, I do hope we get there in the fall. And I heard many people uh, from the board suggest that that's the goal and that's where we're heading to. Um, I look at the data that was presented today and um, I have, am not comfortable with what I consider to be a minority opinion calling for five days in person, um, bullying what's a, a majority opinion, which is that of the young Rossi girl at the beginning, that there be a balance between in-person and um, uh, hybrid. Uh, if we go five days, full days, I don't know what happens to the parents who um, don't want that, who feel as though we're not ready for that. Uh, I want to also echo the speaker two or, two or three people ago about how this is not just an issue for the children, but it's a worker safety issue, right? Our teachers are being put in situations which are not safe. Many of them are not inoculated. Um, many of these buildings do not have functioning windows. They don't have adequate air conditionings. They don't have adequate ventilation, um, right? The, the doctor is- the Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Sorry about that. I would hope I could reclaim that time. Okay. Um, the doctor is not in a situation that a teacher is in having 20, 25 students in a poorly ventilated space without proper spacing. I urge the board to maintain uh, adherence to the science. Uh, if the science changes, then I'm all for that. It looks like we will go from six feet to three feet uh, with the CDC, then we should adjust. And if new findings come uh, after that, we should adjust again. And then the, um, the cherry picking of the data um, I'm not sure who was mentioning the, uh, the Europeans, but my, my Google searches show that Greece is not in school right now, parts of Italy, parts of the Czech Republic, Denmark, Portugal. Right? It's, it's not as if the whole rest of the world is back in school. Right? People are following the trends in their particular environment. They're looking at the science and they're adjusting. And that's what I heard the board say they were gonna do today. That's what I heard the superintendent say they were gonna do today. Um, I wanna applaud you for the hard work you're doing and know that you have the majority of this community supporting you as you move forward with your work. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Eimer. Jason Badaloni. Jason Badaloni. Okay, let's, let's try um, Nicole McKenna. Hi, hi, I'm Nicole McKenna. I live at 135 East Browning Road. I have three children that attend Mark Newby Elementary School in grades kindergarten, first grade and fourth grade. And um, first off, I'd like to say that um, I am of the group of people who are uh, in favor of the children returning to in-school instruction as soon as possible. Uh, that being said, I also believe that the children, the teachers are doing a wonderful job. And uh, I very much appreciate all of my children's teachers and all the teachers that are doing their job through this pandemic, because I'm sure it's not easy. Um, and also, you know, I just want to state that I don't feel that the people who are trying to advocate for their kids to get back into the school in person have anything, have any fight against people who aren't for that. Like if you wanna keep your kids remote, 
then keep your kids removed. That's your choice. And I don't have a problem with that if that's your choice. I know that for me, I don't want my kids staring at a computer screen four hours a day for five days a week. I just don't think it's healthy for them. Uh, I think that they need to have social interaction. So I really just would like to, uh, I don't really have a lot of um, hope to go back in this year, but I would really like to see uh, a definite plan for September. Like Tim said, the governor said it, should, it shouldn't even be a question. We should have a definite plan on how we're gonna return in September. And I'd like to like have that plan and, and it could change by then, I'm sure, but it's something we should be thinking about. Uh, I know that just recently, uh, Dr. Fauci um, publicly said that he believes the CDC is going to change their guidelines for schools from six feet social distancing to three feet social distancing. And I'm wondering if the schools are, are taking that into consideration while they're making their plans for a return in the school. So again, I just saying, you know, uh, I do hope that we can all work together as a community, but uh, personally I am in favor for my children getting in-person face-to-face schooling uh, five days a week. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. McKenna. Uh, Summer, I'm sorry if I'm gonna pronounce your, name, your last name wrong, Agrodnik. Yes, that was perfect. <laughs> Thanks. Um, I'm Summer Ogrodnik, um, 348 Haddon Ave. Um, so I am also in favor for um, my children um, to be back in school. Um, they are struggling. I am struggling. Um, I have two school age children currently in Mark Newby School. I'm extremely, I'm extremely concerned about the current hybrid plan and how there's no real plan in sight for September. Um, I know this has been talked about, but many neighboring townships um, are reopening um, entirely. Um, I do think the school administrators and the staff should be commended for how they have handled themselves during all of this. I feel most teachers have done the impossible when trying to keep our children moving forward but that being said, the Zoom instruction is not working. It's, it's not working at all for my kids. I understand that we have to rise above and just say this is temporary and, and just say we're, we're getting through this. But I don't think my kids can do this any longer. Um, my fourth grader suffers um, from major anxiety. Um, it has only been heightened by remote learning as she performs her classwork. She performs her classwork every day with her camera off. She has such fear with people looking at her and seeing her being frustrated with tears every day. She is in desperate need of classroom environment to face her anxiety in a healthy way with her peers and teachers. Her mental health and social development has declined. Electronic remote education has robbed my children of that interpersonal relationship that is developed between teachers and her peers and it is definitely stunting her social growth. My second grader is stunted in different ways as she continues to struggle and have continuous meltdowns over and over about not understanding the subject matter being placed before her. She relies heavily on me to advocate for her to, to, for academic support, which I am not always able to, to provide. I am a working parent who is also raising a three-year-old while my schoolwork, while their schoolwork cannot be done on their own. It, it just, it cannot. My daughters are in desperate need of an in-person instruction environment. The remote education model leaves too much room for the student to become distracted and disconnected. The current Zoom hybrid model fails us because while our children are in person, they are still on their Chromebooks with headphones in the classroom. Our teachers are forced with having to make sacrifices that are depriving our children. 
My second grader, her printing and writing has now been replaced with typing on Google Docs. I can no longer watch as this continues to happen. I can't stand for this type of education. I refuse to witness my children and other children continue to fall behind in their education and social skills. I think we need to act now. Our children deserve to be in school full time with a teacher that is dedicated to teaching in-person students. Thank you. Thank you. Amanda Kimmel. Good evening, everyone. I'm speaking as a parent, a licensed clinical social worker, a hospital administrator, and the spouse of the teacher. First and foremost, I want to thank our educators and support staff who have worked tirelessly to support our children's learning. throughout this pandemic, all well faced certainty of the time. I also want to thank our school board and our local school officials for proactively facilitating a partnership with the local health system to ensure our teachers and staff are vaccinated in an expeditious manner. I do want to note that teachers were only eligible for vaccines in New Jersey as of today, and the entire vaccination process takes approximately six weeks. So with this, please know that our teachers won't be fully protected until early May. I specifically want to mention that Reagan Caden, our board president, and Dr. McDowell, our new superintendent, were working on this vaccine partnership prior to Murphy's announcement that teachers would be eligible for vaccines on the 15th. Reagan also helped to spearhead the district's mental health partnership with Jefferson, and it's evident how deeply she cares about the health and well-being of our students. I very much appreciate the measured plan to expand in-person learning gradually and safely and in accordance with science. I can tell you today that our inpatient census at Jefferson is higher than it's been since February 23rd with COVID positives, and the positivity rate from our testing centers is up to almost 10% again. At the moment, no one in the medical community is certain how things will play out. There's a new predictive model circulating that's anticipating another surge due to these new variants, and I think it certainly makes sense to err on the side of caution in this situation. I will tell you all that COVID ripped through my family in early January. And while no one can ever be sure exactly how they contracted COVID, we tested positive several days after receiving the dreaded school letter that there was COVID in the school. We knew that this was a possibility when we decided to send our child back to school, but I do want everyone to understand that you can be a healthy adult and a healthy child and still get very, very sick from COVID, sicker than I could have ever imagined. So thanks again to our board and school officials for paying close attention to the science before making decisions that could potentially put our community at risk. We're fortunate to have you at the helm of the ship, and I can speak for many when I say that we're safer because of the decisions you've made. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Kimmel. Marianne Nolan. Hi. Um, first, I want to thank the teachers because as a former classroom teacher, I really do trust that they are doing their best. They are not in an easy situation. I would never wanna be in their position. And I think they're doing everything they can to support our students. Um, that being said, I do wanna to say to Dr. McDowell for saying that, you know, it's not a competition to open schools as fast as we can. I don't think anybody said that. I don't think we're trying to compete with other districts. I think everyone that wants schools open or want them open more and want to plan for September want the best for our kids. And what we're doing is not the best for our kids. We're the only ones that aren't doing it. So why? Um, someone else said that we, you know, we're honoring the commitment that we made to our teachers and to our students. We're not. We we have a commitment to these students to provide the best, to keep them safe, to make sure they're happy and in a learning environment where they feel supported. That's not happening at home in front of the screen where they don't have access to, um, to be able to feel comfortable to ask a, the teacher a question or to get that reassurance from a peer sitting next to them. Um, someone else said that, you know, we need to rise to the occasion. It's, that's so much easier said than done. I was a former classroom teacher. My daughter wants nothing to do with me teaching her these things. She needs to be in a classroom with a teacher that she trusts, with her peers that she feels comfortable with and supported by in order to learn. Um, the mental health aspect of it is a huge, huge part of it for us as a family. 
again, rising to the occasion, we've done everything we can to support our daughter. We've tried everything we can to make her happy, to support her, to make her feel loved and just let her be the happy seven-year-old that she should be. It, this is not a natural environment for her. And no matter what we do as parents, she's not happy. She's uh, crumbling emotionally. I've seen her in tears over things and breaking down over things um, that wouldn't have caused her a worry before. And it is 100% because of this school situation and it's not working for her. Um, I don't think that it's something that everyone needs to do. I do think that having the option to stay remote for those parents that choose that should be the case. But I do think that we do need to keep moving forward to look at how we're going to open schools more than two days a week, more than three days a week, and what we're doing in September, because we're failing our students. That's it. Thank you, Ms. Nolan. Donna Helms? Do you have to stand there and laugh at me the whole time? Hi. Uh, I want to say I'm a proud newbie parent and I see the newbie teachers on here and I just want to tell them thank you so much. I think they've done an excellent job. Um, anything that my child has needed, they have gone above and beyond always. I really appreciate them. Um, I also want to thank the new superintendent. It can't be easy to take this job during a pandemic. And I think you're doing a great job. I love the communication. Um, I want to commend the Board of Education as well for what to me seems to be taking a thoughtful, reflective approach that I'm sorry, my dog is sorry. Um, thoughtful, reflective approach that um, I agree with. I think it was Amanda Kimmel. Like we we really don't know what's happening and what's changing day to day. And I really appreciate the fact that they, I'm sure, are um, checking in with experts and with science. They might not be um, checking in with some of the people who uh, spoke today, but that I shouldn't assume that that means they're not checking in with anyone. Um, so I appreciate the flexibility of things change, things change. Um, but for now, I applaud you and all the hard work and I appreciate everything that you guys are doing. Thank you, Ms. Helms. Uh, Frankie Fontenis, sorry if I pronounced that incorrectly. Hi, uh, hi, thank you. And uh, yeah, this is Frankie Fontenis and we live at 251 Crestmont Terrace and we are parents of a second grader and a soon to be kindergartner. Uh, Dr. McDowell, welcome. <laughs> and. Uh, I say that with a smile because uh, I do not envy your position. Uh, thank you to Brian Kolak. Thank you for, uh, to Mrs. Floyd and the crew at Tatum. Uh, thank you to the board. Um, I guess the one thing I, I want to apologize to, to my family is that we're not on social media uh, and, and we're not a part of what has been going on. Uh, but I will say uh, I'm really proud to see all of the educated, uh, passionate, uh, and people that are focused on our kids in this community. I think it's really important. Uh, uh, Maggie's husband, uh, John, uh, Jacob, Dave, uh, Eleanor, Marianne said a lot of smart things, a lot of things that we agree with. It's great to see a 90 day plan. I'd love to see a 45 day plan. Uh, I'm in a business where it's results driven. Uh, and if we need to pivot and change, then so be it. But we need our kids to get back to school. We need to be focused on that uh, for them. And uh, it's not about uh, seeing who's right or who's wrong or whose kids are dealing with this better or worse than others. It's about all of them and working as a community to get them back in school and get a real plan in place. So it's great to see the 90 day plan. I thank you for that but maybe we could see a 45 day plan uh, and make some adjustments if we have to. Uh, uh, as I said, uh, I'm in the investment world. My wife, Dr. Courtney Cavanaugh is a clinical psychologist uh, and we uh, intend to be, continue to be a part of these conversations. There were a lot of great things said today. Uh, and I think we all just need to move to strive to get our kids back to school safely uh, and for the betterment uh, for all of us and all of them. Uh, thank you. 
Thank you, Mr. Fontanez. I believe the next person is Alexandria Guido. Guido Smith, <laughs> sorry. Thanks. Um, uh, thanks for acknowledging. I uh, wanted to say thank you to the board and to the superintendent for the, the hard work that, that's been done to get the, the ch our children to this point. We've been very pleased with um, Mr. Kulak at Tatum and the entire staff. And as an early childhood educator, you know, I, I, if there are any teachers that are still left, um, I just want to make sure that they know how deeply we appreciate all of the hard work that they do every day. Um, truly, this is, has to be one of the most taxing years uh, in any educator's experience. And, you know, our child comes home and sits in front of her computer and has a smile on her face every day. And it's because of the work that, that uh, the teachers do and it comes from you know, it comes from Mr. Kulak, it comes from the board, it comes from um, the entire district. So we are, we're very, very happy to be here and we're happy to have the plan to get them back in, in uh, full time in September. And we tell our fifth grader, you know, every day that it's tough, that she'll, you know, hopefully in September, things will look a little bit normal. And, and it is our hope that that, that will be the case. Um, I had a question and then just a, a couple of points. You know, my, my daughter goes in and uh, her cohort is very small. And if the opposing cohort is also very small, is it something that the administration would look at to bring some children in some classes in full, for four full days uh, if another class couldn't do that? Or is it the, the district's plan to wait until everybody can come in uh, four days? Um, number one. Uh, the second thing is, um, as an, uh, I'm a reading specialist who sits on the INRS team, I would reach out to the parents. My, my heart hurts for those parents who are talking about their children that are having a very difficult time. And I would ask those parents um, to reach out to the schools, to talk to your guidance counselors, to talk to your teachers, to have a meeting with the Intervention and Referral Service Committee um, based in your school. If your child is, is having a mental health crisis, if they are crying, if they're having those issues, talk to the, the people in your building, talk to your principals, talk to your guidance counselors, because this is hard for everybody. And, you know, there is capacity there to help you. So I hope that, um, that some parents, if they haven't done that already, you know, it's that, that that's something that they could um, possibly look into for helping their, their children. Um, I had a question about, um, I saw that there was money in the budget for summer. Uh, I just want to say that I hope um, that the plans for moving forward with the summer program, uh, reaching those, those students that are really having a difficult time is, is going to be in person. I would ask if the board, you know, push to make that an in-person thing, if at all, if at all possible. Um, and finally for us, we, um, we have a fifth grader and we just got our lottery notice that our preschooler was accepted to preschool penguins. We are thrilled. And, um, you know, we know that there are, we're so happy to be that, that Collinswood has the program and happy to be a part of it. And we know that there were people who did not get spaces. And we hope again, that if there are extra budget money moving forward, that um, having a universal preschool is the greatest building block that a school district can have for, for all of their students. It's a great um, equalizer and um, a great way to start kids off on the right foot. And we hope that if there are extra funds, that that is something that the district will think about. Thank you. Thank you very much. I believe I was scrolling through, there was some comments. I believe Brett Wiltsey is next. Good evening, everyone. Brett Wiltsey. Uh, we live at 1024 Stokes Ave. I have two children in elementary school. <clears throat> Just wanted to, to uh, let everyone know that really my biggest disappointment tonight is I was expecting a little bit more of a multi-pronged approach that was kind of recognizing that we're in a fast changing environment. And what I heard was, we're gonna use the same approach we did in March. If the county says red, we can't, we can't do anything. But the world now is different than it was a year ago. Um, number one, our president said we're, every adult in America is gonna be vaccinated by May 1st. That doesn't seem to be considered at all in your plan. Our county college is vaccinating over 2000 people a day. Most of it is the Johnson & Johnson shot. That's the one shot. So that's a much quicker process. I love to hear that our staff had the opportunity to get vaccinated. I think that's a great program. Uh, I'm thrilled that that happened. Hopefully most people took advantage of that. Um, the healthcare system, 
now knows how to deal with these patients a hell of a lot better than they did a year ago when they were just trying to catch up to the process. So the sick aren't getting as sick as they were before. So the environment's changed. We have to be, we have to be responsive to the, to the environment. What I, what I fear is that, you know, come mid-May, everyone in New Jersey will be vaccinated and, and we're going to have a situation where our kids are going to get nine extra hours of, of instruction for the month, three hours on three Wednesdays. That, that plan is going to be dated if, if this uh, works out. I have a question I know you're not going to answer. It's public comment, but is there a consortium of local schools working together to coordinate an approach? And the reason why I ask that is it's pretty clear the county is not preventing us from extending extra time for our students. Other schools are doing it. We're electing to, to go much slower than they are. You know, if we got together with other groups and, and shared ideas, that may be helpful to all of us. Look, I love the schools. Those who know me, I love this town. I do a lot of a lot and everything I can to do to make the town better. But what I really worry about is that we're going to be embarrassed when we have a program that's fault lags far behind our, our neighboring towns and our peers, especially in this environment. So in closing, I'm only asking you for one thing, and that's what all good leaders do. Just please plan, plan for the worst, but hope for the best. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Wilkie. And I was listening to you and not scrolling, so my apologies. Katie Sullivan is next. You're, you're muted, Katie. Hi. Um, my name is Katie. I, oh, shit. Can you hear me now? Yes. Okay, sorry. My name is Katie Sullivan. I have four children, one in the high school. Um, side to this is that I am a nurse. I've been a nurse for several years. I walked into work in March and was told that my entire unit was a COVID unit. And I took care of COVID patients and I continued to take care of COVID patients. Um, I was very scared. My one son has a health condition. Um, scared isn't the right word. I was terrified. I cried a lot. But the bottom line is that I'm an essential worker. The community needs me. And I responded to what I had to do. And throughout that time frame, with wearing proper PPE, washing my hands, changing my clothes, I never contracted COVID prior to even getting a vaccine. I'm now vaccinated. I feel a little bit better but I'm still worried. Um, sorry, Katie, I think we're, we're losing you. I, and I think just in the interest of time. Um, get how scary this is. However, suffering from all of this, they, um, is that fair? So my thing is, is that, can you hear me? So yeah. going forward um, with everything, I understand the fear of being exposed and spreading it. What I don't understand is that our kids go to school or we're going to school for two days for four hours. Now we're adding additional time. So we're cross, we're increasing exposure across the board. My kids are not thriving off of four hours. Um, my kids weren't thriving two days of school with four hours, and they're still not thriving when two out of four were asked to have to go back for longer times. Um, their mental health has declined. My son cries every day and tells me how much he does not like school. My daughter, my daughter is struggling in school too. And yes, we are pushing through and we're doing the best that we can do but we don't have the support that we need. So I don't understand why, what the difference is between four hours in school to a full day in school. And the, there was also um, talk about how we shouldn't compare ourselves to surrounding schools. However, if the surrounding schools are thriving and their, their COVID numbers are not going up, I think that is only more encouragement for our school district to push we need a plan that is clear. I feel that our plans 
are not very clear to us, the parents. Um, so going forward, that's my biggest issue is that our kids need more time and to consider their mental health. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Sullivan. Stephen Huang. Hi, can you hear me? Yes. All right, I'm Stephen Huang. I'm at 741 Park Avenue. Um, I've got two kids attending Collingswood High School, and I have absolutely no doubt, based on my experiences with the Collingswood schools through Garfield, CMS, and now the high school, that the teachers, staff, and administrators are doing their level best to take care of the kids and help them learn. So first off, thanks to all of you for that. Um, I feel like what you've been doing so far as a board, as an administration, uh, has been appropriately cautious and thoughtful. Um, that said, I'm speaking from a particular perspective because I consider myself fortunate that I can work from home. So it isn't as big of a logistical problem for me to have my kids learning remotely. And I know that's not the case for everyone. Um, I also know that online learning is not working well for some kids. Um, we've heard from several parents tonight um, about that, whether it's learning, social development, mental health, and that puts us in a really tough place as a community. Um, I think several folks tonight have talked about wanting to have a plan uh, and particularly a clear commitment to going back to full in-school instruction as soon as possible, for example, this fall. Um, and that is a focus on a particular result. And it's a result that some folks in our community want because they're legitimately worried about how their kids are doing. Um, but bouncing off of Jake Lehman's remark early on uh, about process versus results, I wanna actually say that I care a whole lot about process. Um, and I'm a little bit worried that if we're sh we shift our focus to a particular result and specifying goal a goal, without making it super clear uh, exactly how many factors have to go into making the decisions to get there that we're gonna get blindsided. Um, I know there's other schools nearby that are doing more in-person instruction, um, but um, if we wanna follow that path, we have to compare apples to apples. What are all the little factors that are different in say Haddon Township or Haddonfield than they are in Collingswood? How are the buildings different? How are, how are the staff arrangements different? How does that all affect any kind of plan we would make? Um, so I think what my suggestion to the board is simply that it would be useful to explicitly and clearly share all the different factors that you guys are wrestling with as you consider your plan. I appreciated the presentations tonight and they were helpful, but I'm really talking about at the level of granularity of the things that come up when you're sitting in a room trying to draw up a plan and somebody says, wait a second, what about X? Um, and you're, you're, you all sit there and you're like, oh, okay, how are we gonna deal with X? So knowing that you've considered all of those points explicitly, I think would help, and this is my opinion, um, that would help reassure some folks that you're, you're seriously considering um, all, of the, all of the things you need to as you make a phase back in plan. Uh, that said, I think any phase back plan is gonna have to be gradual so that you can adapt to the things you discover that go wrong as you try to phase back in. That's one of the things I've appreciated about the approach so far is that because it's gradual, you have time to collect data and correct course if something's not working. Uh, I encourage you to take the offer from Dr. Flibbit and his colleagues um, because they can probably help you be flexible and agile um, as new data and new science comes up. Um, and from my perspective, staying flexible could mean lots of things. It could mean you have one main plan, but you expect it to change as things go forward. I think that seems to be where we are at the moment. Um, or it can mean having multiple possible plans, different prongs, I think somebody said, uh, that, that kick in depending on conditions. And no matter which way you plan to be flexible, I think the more you can communicate with the community all of the different things you're considering, be explicit about it, that will be helpful. Uh, one other, uh, or two other thoughts really quickly. One is that um, there's cost to flexibility. 
um, from at least, for, uh, I'm, uh, I'm going to say from the perspective of teachers, it's not a trivial thing to have to adapt what you're doing, your instruction over and over again as the plan changes. You know, it's hard to create a good lesson for a group of kids with a range of learning needs when all the external variables are up in the air and could change. Number of kids, whether, you know, what kind of room arrangement you have, are you in a tent outside, do you have access to technology? Um, so. I would consider the costs of being a little too flexible and changing on a dime. Um, and finally, just a, uh, just a uh, thing to think about outside of the box. What about seeing if um, there are families willing to volunteer to keep their kids home for if their kids are doing well with virtual learning to make space for more kids that are having trouble with learning virtually, whether they need more social support or anything like that. You know, if, if, if there are families where that's okay, you get some more room where you can bring some kids in. Though it sounds like outside of the high school, that may not be very feasible. And that's all I've got to say. Thank you. Thank you. Um, Pauline Savage. Pauline Savage. I'm good, thank you. Okay. Uh, I'm, I'm scrolling, sorry folks. Um, not sure. Re Regan, I see a, a Lauren Robbins. Okay, Lauren Robbins. Hi, Hi, good evening. Thank you. Um, welcome, Dr. McDowell. I'm Lauren Robbins. I'm at 114 Washington Avenue. I have two children in the district, one at the middle school and one at Tatum Elementary. Um, as many have said, we want to, you know, express our appreciation for to the teachers, the principals, the staff, the board for everything that you've balanced in this difficult year. Um, I know you're not answering questions this evening, but I just wanted to express a few things that I'd be looking for in future communications from um, the superintendent, from the board, from the district. Um, one is that there is um, very clear intent stated about what the plan is for next fall. I haven't heard personally that there's a clear intent to offer five full days of in-person learning in the fall. So I think restating that in a communication would be very helpful along with a very clear and specific action plan and timing to get us there. We certainly appreciate there has to be a lot of contingency plans. There's a lot of things that are unknown and I, I think that that's well understood and appreciated, but more specifics about, um, as the gentleman who was speaking just before me, you know, specifically what are all of the considerations and, and who is involved in developing those plans. Um, I'd also be interested in hearing more details about the summer program that I think we heard a little bit about earlier in the meeting this evening. Um, and I'm also curious if there is a list of um, intended uses for the funds that will be um, coming our way to help us support in that plan. So thank you for your time this evening. Thank you. Um, Megan Nikolsky. Hello everyone and thank you so much for taking my comments. Um, I wanted to speak as a teacher in the Cherry Hill School District. I teach high school, so I appreciate how difficult this whole situation is. I am here to tell you, as I'm sure many of the parents out there with uh, secondary school students, that um, secondary students are not coming to school, whether it is their choice, it is their family's choice. Um, I, I, I don't have a lot of students in my classes. Be that as it may, um, recently, my district did choose to open learning to four days, and um, I have more students than I used to, um, but not, not, not a ton. So um, I appreciate that this whole situation is fluid, and um, we take a lot of precautions and, uh, you know, masks and sanitizer and ventilation and things like that. And um, is, is the situation perfect? No, it's certainly not perfect. And um, I send my own son to Collinswood High School. And as I'm sure many of you know, um, he is there by himself in a lot of classes. So everyone is making their own choices. And um, I, I completely appreciate that. Um, so 
what I am suggesting is that, similar to many um, parents here, is that um, you know, perhaps there is a middle ground. You know, similar to what many parents have said tonight, um, perhaps there is a middle ground based on space. There are some um, schools such as Garfield Elementary that are at capacity. So obviously we don't wanna put anyone in danger. So maybe uh, the four day is not an option. But in the high school, where many students are not coming to school for uh, a lot of different reasons, perhaps there, there can be more room for a lot of people. So the situation is fluid. And uh, I think that, you know, again, We lose her or did lost. She, she's still there, but we lost audio. I'm sorry, Ms. Mikulski, we, we lost. So I, I feel that there can be a middle ground here. Uh, so students whose families believe that they should stay home, then they continue to stay home. And um, families who believe who want their, their students back in, in the schools, I think that we can find a way to make that happen. So I, I just, uh, and, and again, I understand the risk because I, I face it myself. So, um, you know, I, I would like to see that that happen. And I just wanted to throw that in there that uh, perhaps we could find some kind of a middle ground. But again, um, considering the weather's getting nicer, more vaccinations are becoming available. I would like to see our district um, become like a lot of other districts who realize that there are there there is room to um, uh, increase the amount of in-person uh, learning as long as it is uh, safe for everybody. And, and again, I, I cannot thank the teachers of Collinswood enough for everything they've done. And um, Mrs. Mikulski, I'm sorry, we've, we've lost audio with you again. She can't hear me either, I don't think. Um, we couldn't hear the, the end, but thank you. Um, thank you for what you were saying. Um, I'm gonna, I'm just gonna move on to the next person, uh, Harper Allen Harper. Hi, um, I'm Harper Allen Harper, this is 290 Fairway Avenue. Um, can, can you hear me? Yes. <laughs> okay, hi, I'm Harper Allen Harper, this is 629 Fairway Avenue. I'm a ninth grader at Clive's High School, my sister's a senior. And I think that a lot of, I've been paying attention throughout the night. And I think that there's been a lot of like people talking from a perspective of having kids in elementary school and not a lot of people who have kids in middle school or high school. And I think that the experience of students in elementary school versus high school or middle school is super different as middle, like middle school and high school students have a different workload, different teachers and, the step and different schedule. I think that elementary school students um, may not have as much work as high school students do. So kind of forcing a bigger schedule onto students who already are stressed out from having SAT or AT, AP classes. My sister is a senior, so she has college applications. And a lot of people, including myself, um, have different sleep schedules now because we've been able to sleep in more and have like more time to sleep, obviously. I mean, we lost an hour a couple days ago, but it's a, um, I think that a lot of the people who want all five days back don't really, I mean, I'm not, this is just a general vision. I don't know what everyone thinks, but there's not um, a vaccine that's been cleared for people younger than 16. And I think that people who want to send their specifically elementary school age students back for all five days, it's, it's definitely dangerous to send your kids back for multiple hours all with all of their classmates, because even though it's not as likely for kids to get it, it still does pass between students. I knew people in the, in the fall who um, got COVID and I knew that when I, I decided to do marching band. So we are paired with a football team and there were a couple of football players who got it. And I mean, I don't really personally know many people who haven't had it or have been exposed to it. Um, there was a teacher that my sister had who came to the school having like they have being positive, even though there's false negative involved. But it's just I think that the, the experience is so much different and it's hard to kind of just assume what everyone like 
thinks is best when everyone has a different student experience. And that's really all. Thank you, Harper. Um, Jennifer Woodring Shea. Uh, I pass. Okay, um, if that's the case, unless any other board members that have been looking at the chat, did I miss any names? I tried not to, but I just, not trying to deny anyone their chance to speak. I think I, you're okay, Reagan. I think you okay. hit everybody. I think you got everybody. All right, great. Um, so just uh, quickly before we move on, um, I just wanted to reiterate that um, we aren't, uh, we aren't intentionally um, trying to ignore questions or not answer questions. We're actually trying to, to more closely follow the, the public comment protocols, particularly because we knew there were going to be so many people speaking, but honestly, because we've been trying to work through this as a public comment issue for a while, but also because we knew that these were very important issues to, to all of you, that in the interest of providing the most accurate and detailed answers to your questions, we wanted to, instead of having to answer on the spot, really be able to take notes and actively listen and um, then come up with responses that will most likely show up in Dr. McTowell's Friday update. So it won't be too much time. It's not like you're gonna have to wait until the next board meeting to hear uh, some answers to your questions. And certainly if there was anything of a more personal nature, most likely um, someone from the school district will be reaching out to you personally. So we thank everyone for, um, for taking the time to, to give us your feedback tonight. Uh, There's one more chat. There's one more chat somebody asked to talk. Uh, well, there's another public comment section at the end, and we have um, quite a bit of just our regular meeting to get through. So at this point, um, I think I'm going to, to continue. And if someone else wants to, we're not going to deny you your, your time to speak. Um, we're just going to do it at the end of the, the meeting. Uh, so with that, we're going to move on to uh, section eight, which is the superintendent's report. Um, Dr. McDowell. So, uh, so thank you again. Um, we are um, uh, section 8.01 uh, is the uh, enrollment report, which is attached um, for February. We also have the school safety drill report um, that is also attached for the month of February. There are There is no suspension report and no anti-bullying uh, report uh, for this month. Thank you, Dr. McDowell. It is unclear whether um, our, our student reps were able to stick with us uh, through this, but if they are, we're at section nine student reports. Uh, Ayana, Nicolette, or Asia, are you on the call and able to give your report? Yes. Yes, I'm here. Fantastic. Please take it away, Lucy. So I wanted to talk about something we actually, am I, oh, sorry, my name is Asia Yarbrough. I am a student representative for Woodland. Um, I wanted to talk about a conversation that me and Mr. McDow Dr. McDowell, sorry, actually had a couple days ago. I think it was like last Thursday and Friday, we had two meetings actually. And um, we're actually looking forward to coming up with some ideas to try to get some seniors back in the building. Some seniors don't feel comfortable coming back. And I know, of course, you guys don't want to force it. But some seniors, you know, it is our last year. And we do understand, after hearing all the parents earlier, I understand what it feels like. It has been hard. But I think that us being at home is safer for everyone. And I appreciate your teachers so much for everything they've done for us. Um, we're looking to come up with some ideas and activities for the senior to get together in a safe manner, of course, probably outside since the weather is getting better, um, where we can just create some memories before we leave. We, we weren't able to have the senior year we wanted, but it's not anyone's fault. This is just something that happened that none of us can control. And I really appreciate Dr. McDowell for stepping in and really hearing what we had to say, because regardless of all the comments tonight, I want you to know that you're doing an amazing job for someone who just came and you're really hearing us out. And I want to really say that I appreciate you. And also that the, the teachers at Collinswood are doing an amazing job as well. Every single time I email them, they email me back with no issue. Mr. Jen is always there when I need him. He answers like my email in like three seconds. So I really appreciate you guys. I want to let, let you guys know that you guys are doing an amazing job. Thank you, Asia. Um, Nicolette or Ayana, do you, do you have anything to add? Um, yes, along with um, what Asia just said, um, wait, sorry, um, I'm Nicolette Rayo, 
and I'm also one of the steward um, student board members this year. And along with what um, Asia just said, um, I just want to thank um, Dr. McDowell for like everything that he has um, done with the last two meetings that we had with him. He's actually hearing us out. And along with Asia said, we're coming up with some ideas um, for the seniors just to bring I think we lost her audio. I see it. Do we, we lose her? Um, do we, uh, Ayana, are you on the call? Well, maybe while, while she's getting her, if Nicolette's uh, sound can come back, I did just want to say I think that's fantastic that um, our, our student board reps are, are working with Dr. McDowell to come up with some creative ways to still have the seniors have some semblance of uh, you know a senior year and senior activities and, and also I know he talked about working to, to kind of use that as a, a bit of a, a carrot to entice um, some more students back into the building as well um, so I saw you unmute yourself Dr. McGallum if you wanted to maybe fill in some I, of I just wanted to to share that um, Asia, Nicolette, and Ayana represent um, very powerful voices within our school community. And one of the things that we have discussed is how do we continue to elevate student voice uh, so that we are talking to our students and not talking at or about our students. Um, they each have very unique uh, perspectives based on their lived experience. And they have been able to provide some, some pretty spot on feedback on significant ways that we can improve within our district. Um, I'm gonna continue to work with our students because uh, what they say has meaning and it has value. Uh, and I'm just so proud of, of what they've done even in this short time. Uh, so I do wanna say that um, our students share the concerns on both sides that have been expressed this evening. Uh, so I would just encourage us to continue to find uh, definitive ways to be able to include our students in these, these discussions. Thank you, Dr. McDowell. And all right, so moving along, uh, we are at section 10, the business administrator board secretary report, Ms. Coleman. All right, very briefly tonight, um, this evening I'm looking for approval uh, for your February 2021 monthly transfers, your February 2021 secretary treasurer's reports, financial statements, um, your student activity reports, your February 2021 uh, food service financial statements. And then this evening is a listing of the March 2021 purchase orders, as well as a listing of the, uh, the March um, bills that will be paid tomorrow morning. So items 11.01 .01 through 11.09 .09 are all the items that I just stated above. Thank you. Ms. That's Ken. it, thank you. Uh, then we are up to section 11, the Buildings, Grounds, and Finance Committee. Mr. Craig. Um... Thank you, Reagan. Um, the Finance, Buildings, and Grounds Committee reviews all financial statements, purchase orders, and warrants on a monthly basis. The committee also reviews and approves all contracts with outside service providers and oversees all maintenance and capital improvement projects district-wide. Uh, tonight, we are seeking approval for uh, items 1101 to 1120. Um, most of which were just outlined by um, Ms. Coleman, but just again, um, the 1102 is approval of transfer, transfers, 1103, um, approval of the board secretary certification, no budgetary line item account um, has exceeded the amount appropriated by the board, um, no over expenditures in the monthly financial report, secretary and treasurer reports, student activities, food services statement, purchase orders, warrants, um, we are also putting in, and the board is putting for resolution urging relief to increase costs to school districts resulting in the implementation of Chapter 44, the 2020 School Employee Health Benefits Reform Law, um, which just for uh, some context with the changes to the health law, uh, the school district is assuming a lot more of the costs related to providing health insurance for staff and faculty. Um, and we are just advocating at the state for some relief uh, for those added costs um, and the, the changes that that will cause to our budget moving forward uh, being pretty substantial. 11.1 um, is the approval of um, to provide psychologi psychological educational evaluations in Spanish um, at a rate of $400 per, 
per, per evaluation as needed for the remainder of the school year. Um, revised shared preschool contract with Oak Lynn. Submission of the preschool budget to the NJDOE. Submission of the school district budget to the NJDOE. A nursing agreement with Our Lady of Lourdes um, for district school nurses to provide clinical nursing experience. Um, heading um, starting in August through July of 2022. Um, moving on the recommendation also in terms for uh, risk management consultants with Hardenborough Insurance Group. Um, moving on the superintendent's uh, proposal for to participate in the ACS NJ School Board Association Cooperative Pricing System for procurement of proprietary computer software and services. Submission of a 1118 submission of IDEA basic application for 2021. Uh, 1119 is an agreement with St. Teresa's of Calcutta for to be able to use our track and field um, facilities, uh, as long as they do not conflict with our own school's use of the facility, facilities. And then finally, um, the Collingswood Book Festival use of facilities for Saturday, October 2nd. Um, moving to approve this use uh, if needed, if the weather won't allow to be outside. Thank you, Mr. Craig. Uh, so we are looking for approval of items 11.01 to 11.20 uh, this evening. Do I have a motion? So moved. And a second? Second. Are there any comments or questions from board members? Roll call, please. Connor? Yes. Mr. Chu? Yes. Mr. Craig? Yes. Ms. Henry? Yes. Ms. Mello? Yes. Ms. Rivera? Yes. Mrs. Severino? Yes. Ms. Celia? Yes. Mr. Stotts? Yes. Mrs. Caden? Yes. Uh, moving on to section 12, curriculum committee, Ms. Severino. The curriculum committee oversees and approves the district curriculum and assessment programs, as well as field trips, home instruction, co-curricular programs, and the school calendar. Before uh, I begin items for approval, I wanted to let board members know that the curriculum committee is continuing to discuss and review possible additions to the high school elective offerings, but we do not have any to share for approval at this time. So seeing as we do not have any field trips, moving on to 12.05, which is a home instruction placement, and then 12.06, which is the social and emotional learning resolution, which was brought to us by Principal Santo. Um, it is an opportunity for us as a board to reiterate our support for the current social emotional learning opportunities that were talked about this evening and to encourage ongoing training to staff so that SEL implementation is culturally responsive and is equitably meeting the needs of all of our students. So I, we are looking for approval from items 12.01 to 12.06, right? Is that clear? Seven, I believe. Mm. No? Six. I, I think it's 06, I think that's a miss. Yeah, it six, yeah, it's yeah, a it's typo, I can fix it, yeah. 12.01 to 12.07. Uh, do I have a motion? So moved. And a second? Second. Any comments or questions from board members? Yeah, I, I just have a question, Bill Stotts. Uh, on item 12.06, the social and emotional learning, uh, it asks the board to support the social and emotional uh, curriculum that's ongoing. I'm not sure what that does. Uh, the, the board has the authority to set the uh, the curriculum. So there's, I, I don't see any reason really to support saying that we're gonna do what we're already doing. What? Am I missing something in there? Sorry. Craig, that would be Stel, do you wanna, um, we, we kind of had this discussion a bit at um, curriculum committee just to, to talk through what our reasoning is for, uh, for putting this forward. I'm sorry, Reagan, I, I didn't catch most oh, of Oh, I'm that. sorry. Let me try that again. Um, I was asking if Dr. McDowell um, wanted to share what, why uh, Mr. Santo um, asked us to, yes. to do this. Yes. Um, so uh, National SEL Day is March 26th. 
Um, and what uh, is being requested is that the board take a very uh, public stance in support of the prioritization of social emotional learning um, leading up to uh, National SEL Day, very similar to the stance that the board took in terms of uh, vaccinations for educators. Um, so I, I, so that's, that's the spirit behind this, is that the board being in support of continued uh, prioritization and expansion around social emotional learning leading up to National SEL Day. Okay, thank you. Any other questions or comments from board members? Uh, roll call, please. Mr. Connor? Yes. Mr. Chu? Yes. Mr. Craig? Yes. Ms. Henry? Yes. Ms. Mello? Yes. Ms. Rivera? Yes. Mrs. Severino? Yes. Celia? Yes. <laughs> Mr. Stotts? Yes, except the item marked with the double asterisk where I abstain. And Mrs. Caden? Yes. Moving on to Section 13, Personnel Committee, Ms. Sheridan Celia. Uh, good evening. Uh, the, the Personnel Committee reviews all recommendations for teaching and staff employment, considers co-curricular employment, and considers all professional development opportunities for staff members. This evening, we're looking for approval of items 3.02 through 3.02. 17. Um, the first few, 3.02 through 3.05, are for leave requests. 13.06 through 13.08 are revised contracts. 13.09 is for an extended transfer. 13.10 uh, is a revision to unaligned staff. 13.11 uh, through 1312 are different permanent substitute appointments. Um, the next few are athletic stipends. 13.13 .13 is for the high school. 13.14 is for the middle school. And there are no substitute and tutors at 315 and there's no travel expenses to approve. And therefore we're looking for approval for 13.0 through through I guess 1317, even if we have nothing to approve, correct, Kit Reagan? Sorry, I forgot to unmute. Yes. I think it says to do it through 13.15. Um, okay, I wasn't sure. So approval for 1302 to 1315. Uh, do we have a motion? So moved. And a second. Second. Any comments or questions from board members? Uh, yeah, uh, really quickly, I noticed that there is a, a, a discussion item for, for Dr. McDowell. Um, is that is that one of the things that's on the um, being voted on today? No. Okay, awesome. Thank you. 13.15. Gotcha. Thank you. Any other questions or comments from board members? Roll call, please. Mr. Connor? Yes. Mr. Chu? Yes. Mr. Craig? Yes. Ms. Henry? Yes. Ms. Mello? Yes. Ms. Rivera? Yes. Mrs. Severino? Yes. Cecilia? Yes. Mr. Stotts? Yes, except those items marked with a double asterisk where I abstain. Mrs. Caden? Yes. Okay, moving on to section 14, the policy committee. This is, um, uh, we have a new way of doing things. Uh, so, Mr. Connor, can you? Uh, lead us through that, please. Sure. So the policy committee is a recently established committee to kind of just take a look closer look at um, our policies and uh, regulations. Um, policies frequently get updated and changed, and uh, many of them are uh, mandatory, as you can see, uh, as being symbolized with an M um, on, the, on the agenda. Those policies do come from uh, the state and are required for districts to adopt. Uh, but there are times where you know they, they do call uh, or they they do need special attention drawn to them just so that we can make sure everybody's understanding of what they're doing. And then also if there's places for us to customize those regulations or policies, uh, particularly for the needs of our district. Um, we have a number of policies that have been rolled out. For the most part, most of them are um, 
changing language inside of the policies, um, but the, the heart of the policy stays the same. I wanted to call specific attention to a couple of the policies that were recently sent out to us. Um, one being the lead testing in schools um, and the lead testing in schools revised. This policy is an update from the state requiring districts to um, conduct lead testing in the schools in a three-year cycle. In the past, it was at a five-year cycle. So uh, previously to this, this new update, um, the districts would have to test uh, potable water sources. I believe it's 50% of them every five years. And this will be updated so that the district will now have to do water testing for lead in the water every three years. Um, there's uh, earned sick leave is a, is a revision. Uh, most, most of that is language changes. And the family leave is a new mandated um, policy, but it's actually replacing several updates over the last couple of years into one consolidated new policy. So most, most of it is already enacted and it's just being sort of put into one new policy rather than several um, independent updates. Um, the board resignation and removal is a, is a new update um, more than just, just language. Um, essentially what this is saying is that a board member can be uh, removed from service if they miss three consecutive um, meetings and this updates the understanding of what a meeting is. Uh, previously, a meeting was considered a, a regularly scheduled monthly meeting, and this policy um, is updating that to any meeting at all. If a board member misses any meeting, not just the regular monthly scheduled meetings, um, they can be brought up for removal of, of uh, service. Um, the medical cannabis um, policy, for the most part, it is updating and changing the language instead of, uh, which we already have this, is a medical marijuana policy. It's changing the language to medical cannabis. Um, and there's just some other language tweaks that are inside of that policy as well. Um, and I think that for the most part, the rest of them are, are changes to language in, in um, like some of them still had no, no child left behind language in them and they're being updated to reflect new language in ESSA policy. Uh, anybody, I, no, go ahead. I was gonna say, does anybody have any comments or questions about any of these policies or procedures? Do we have uh, to, I have a question, but it, I don't, do we go through it first or can I ask a question now? I don't know if I'm following the correct procedure. Um, I mean, I, th I think that, so the, the way that policies and procedures are typically passed is through a first and a second reading. Um, and so if there's any comments on any of them, we can um, table a first reading if we want to adopt or change any of those policies and procedures for a later meeting. And okay. then after that, we can move forward on passing a first resolution on any of them. On the, on the abolishing, abolishing of policy, um, a couple of them note that there's only one motion that needs to be had in order for the policy to be abolished. So to pass a policy, there's two readings. To abolish some of them, there's only one reading. Can I ask an additional question? Sure. Um, okay. Um, so it, the language, I mean, I read through the policies. I made notes on ones that um, I, like I saw them. And I think that like, you can see that a lot of it's just obviously just language, like choosing shall and that kind of a thing. Um, but I thought when we had talked about it, we had said that we could possibly customize it or add to, we can add to it, right? So if there's any policies that like the employment of support staff members, there was one in that, like that one, I thought the, uh, I don't know if we're discussing, are we discussing now? Are we able to discuss now? Or is this just a question? I don't know. I don't think I'm following the correct procedure. So I'm gonna stop. Um, I, I think that, that you're fine. Um, if you have a, a question or comment about any of the policies and procedures, we can make note of those and then discuss if we want to do any further changes. Got it. So just make note of the ones that I have a question or comment about. So, and I guess we could, um, Clinton, am I understanding you correctly? We would just table that particular policy for its first read even because there's more discussion that needs to be had or? 
Yes. yes. Yeah, the okay. only policies and procedures that would go to a full vote are ones that aren't being questioned on by anybody or that they don't want to have any further um, language written in or any further dialogue or questions around what's being written into these policies and procedures. Okay, so I, do I say them now, the ones that I? Okay, so yeah. policy 1643. And then um, policy 4125. Okay. And I just had a question about policy 53300, the administration of medical cannabis. So I don't know if that's one we have to table or if someone can just answer the question, but I, we can table it if it's something that we don't discuss right now. What is your, like, what is your uh, question around? Well, it says a designated caregiver. Is that, um, what is that defined as? Um, in, in the policy, it says a designated caregiver and it, it says parent and then it says designated caregiver. That doesn't, so if someone did not have a parent, does, it, does a designated caregiver have to come from the home or do we have staff within the building who can facilitate that if I'm making sense? Cause it is the medication. Yes. And so like, and that's an area where this is exactly why this, I think this policy group is important, right? Is because um, if there's not a legal definition of what a designated caregiver is, <clears throat> there's an opportunity for us to add in what, what that would look like for our particular district. Okay. Then maybe that one too. Then okay. So at the moment I have that we are tabling three policies, policy 1643, a family leave, 4125, employment support staff members, and 5330.01, administrative administration, excuse me, of medical cannabis. Are there any other board members that would like to table any of these policies to take a closer look? Can I ask a question about the, the pre procedure in terms of like the fact that these are all, all um, I guess, mandated policies? What's the timeline in terms of that, that we have in terms of looking over, reviewing, adding to, and then approving. So like, when do we have to have um, these set by? Go ahead, Dan, because we checked it out. Yeah, I, I can kind of help a little with that. There's really no timeline, but you want to keep up with it as much as possible. Kind of consider it like, you know, your college homework, mm -hmm. because we get these updates from Trenton um, monthly. So this is already... I guess we got this in January and it's March and we're just reading it. So we're going to table some and then those are going to go to the next month and then we're going to get the next months. So you um, you want to kind of get in a cycle that you're approving some every month. So your, your policy manual is as up to date as possible. Some school districts don't do anything with policies for years and then they have to pay a service to come in and do them all, right? So we try to do, we try to update them as many as we can every month as the updates come in from Trenton. So your policies are always up to date. So although, although there's no drop dead date, I recommend strongly that you try to stay current with what's being recommended. So in, in, in practical terms, because these are mandated, are we in, in effect beholden to them even if we don't have them approved or, or is it that? You're beholden to the law that the policies reference. Usually the policies come from uh, state law or statute and mm -hmm how basically it's how we're imp implementing a certain law. So case in point is policy number 5330, the medical cannabis. That's what, you know, that came out of, out of law, how we're going to allow, or how we're going to do, uh, uh, aid children that are on medical cannabis. So we have to have a, a plan and a policy in place. So, um, a lot of the policies that we get come from something like that. So we need it to be, we, we need them to be current. Thank you, Ms. Coleman. No problem. Is there any other questions or comments? Um, I am gonna need a motion to table those three policies, if that's what you want to do. So moved. Second. No, oh, sorry. I'm sorry, who seconded? I Mary. did, Mary. Thank you, Mary. And do we need an all in favor for that as well? Yes, please. All in favor? 
Aye. Aye. And then do we also need a motion to approve the rest of them for the first reading or do we not need to approve for first reading? Yes, we do. Okay. So, so we need a motion well, to approve. Yeah, motion to approve the rest of them. 1425 and 5330. Uh, so, sorry to ask another question here. Um, if we approve, so if there are policies that we approve for the first reading that need revision afterwards, how does that process work? I'm sorry. So if we approve something for a first reading and then it gets adapted or changed, it then has to go back to another first reading. Okay. Because uh, I know, for example, the the policy one six four point six, it doesn't have all of the like the options selected for uh, for which you know for how many minutes per public statement, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, and so, in in practice, does it make sense for us to go ahead and table that one and then adjust that, or should we? Like, what what's the move there? What is the, I'm sorry, can you repeat that? So 1646? Six? Yeah, so the, that policy, I believe on, uh, there, uh, there are several uh, options um, on page different six. pages. Yeah, like page six, for example, page four, for example, that has uh, different options that we can choose. Uh, for example, how many minutes uh, with, will the time limit be uh, uh, for public um, comment? Uh, and so those options are still in there and have it been selected. Yeah, so and, and that's so that's another one I think that we can absolutely table that if we want to go through um, you know as a board and, and have a conversation about customizing the policy to best meet the needs of this particular district. What, what would, I mean what would be the alternative because if we pass it for first reading if you pass it for first reading, it then has to pass a second reading. So every policy has to get sort of a, a two-stamp approval process. Anytime there is an amendment or a change to the policy, it has to go back to the very beginning. So um, if, if something goes through the first policy reading, right, and then um, it gets passed, and then it moves on to the second policy reading, and somebody raises a concern with it at that point, um, and the, the result of that concern is that there's an amendment or change to the policy. It is essentially a new policy that has to go back to the beginning and then have another first reading and another second reading. So then if, if this policy were passed through a second, second reading as is, what would be the effect of that? After a second reading and it passes, then any policy is then in effect. Okay, so then I, I motion to, to table uh, uh, 164.6. Or would you like me to just ex explain how we do it? Yes, like, I would also- I mean, that I'm just saying like zero, <laughs> yeah. I mean, I hate us to get like stuck. I mean, we can certainly go in and, and check the boxes, but basically what you do with regard, if I'm looking at this policy, 0164.6, um, I guess it's section D, um, you, you shall require members of the public to state prior to providing public comment whether or not they wish to speak, like in a remote meeting because you asked right. them to identify themselves. So you do that. So we, so, could, we could check shall. So does that have, have to happen before or after? Can that happen after a first reading or does it have to happen before? We could do it right now because this is technically considered the first reading. Um, or I could, you know. It, just as a note, anything, if, it, if it's not a policy until it has a second reading. If right. you change something before that second reading and it has to start over again, uh, it goes with the first reading and second reading. If you pull it out and uh, you uh, don't vote on it at all at the first meeting, it makes no difference because next month it'll still come back. It'll be the first reading. Uh, there's no reason to withdraw them. You, you just change them when you get to the second reading. I, Clinton, correct me if I'm wrong, but my understanding was we were just tabling the ones that we wanted to amend in a bigger way, not like selecting shall, shall not. Like I thought that those selections were going to be done in, in the way they always are done, right? Like what we look at what we do and we check those off. Like is, am I, I, this is our first run through with this policy committee in the way that it's set up. So if I'm, if I misunderstood that, I mean, I pulled aside those as well, but 
I thought we were just sort of tabling the ones we wanted to like amend in a bigger way, like add language to. Is that correct? Is that how you were thinking yes. of it? Yes. So like, you know, Apologies, because I'm I'm clearly the new guy here. No, right? but, no, I just but, didn't know if I was yeah. thinking of it right. So I just don't know if I'm thinking of it right. But from what I'm understanding, from what everyone said, is that basically it was if we when we che end up checking the option, is that a modification to the policy? No, no, it's no. just the board has the option. Like this particular one that you're talking about is conducting your board meetings in public and how you're going to engage with the public, right. how you're going to allow them to speak publicly. Some districts ask community members to submit their name even in right. advance of the board meeting. We don't right. do that, just at the board meeting, right. type your name in chat. So we can check those options between the first and second reading and it won't be an issue. It, we won't yeah. have to go back to the first reading. Correct, because we're not okay. altering the language of the, the policy. We're, we're not right. modifying anything. We're just selecting out of the, the policy that was kind of created for us. It's I a see. selection okay. rather than a modification. Okay. So yeah, so, so my, my interpretation was that it would have been a modification. So, but seeing that we can select those before the second reading and not have to go back makes sense to me. So I withdraw my motion to withdraw um, 0164.6. Okay. All right, so then we need a motion to proceed with the, uh, the, the remaining. So moved. And a second. Second. All in favor? Aye. Aye. And we will as, as we said a few times, this was our first run at a policy committee. It was a little rough. It's also late at night. Uh, we will only uh, get, that will only be a smoother process as time goes on. I, I certainly hope. Um, uh, okay, so section 15 is uh, miscellaneous. However, we don't have um, a HIP report from the previous month. Uh, so we are moving on to section 16, which is our second opportunity for uh, public comment. Uh, this one, it, it entails anything um, that you, it is not just, excuse me, things that were on the agenda. Um, please uh, put your name and your address in the chat if you would like to speak and keep your comments to five minutes or less. Uh, is there anyone that um, would like to speak at this time? Did someone say, I don't, I didn't see that part in the chat. Was there someone who had their name in the chat at the, the last? Jody Farrow um, asked okay. to speak right after we started the meeting back up. I'm not sure if she's still on. Oh, Jody Farrow, if you are still on the call and you would like to make a public comment, please unmute yourself. I'm gonna take that as a no. Um, and I'm not seeing any other. Um... She's not on anymore. Okay, thank you, Adam. <laughs> Reagan, can I speak? Sorry, it's Jody. Yes. Oh, she is on. Okay. I'm sorry. <laughs> I was putting kids to bed and I hopped onto my husband's computer. Hold on, let me really, really quick. I was, okay, let me take off my bathroom. <laughs> sorry, I'm sure everybody else is also in their bathrooms now. Um, I just wanted to, um, follow up to the last thing really in response to uh, Harper Allendorfer and she is wonderful. My husband has coached her in mock trial and stuff and she's so smart. Um, but I kind of didn't want to close. I'm going to go even in here. Um, on ending on the high school kids because, and I know that we have to be cognizant of all of the kids. And for people who don't know me, I have a seventh grader, I have a fifth grader, I have a third grader and I have a first grader. And I have to say overall, my seventh grader and my fifth grader are kind of loving life right now because this is very easy for them. And that partly gives me a whole lot of pause because these are supposed to be the years where they are mentally stretching themselves, where they are in uncomfortable situations, where they're learning to navigate things so that they're prepared when they go to high school, they're prepared when they go to college, things like that. But overall they're doing okay, okay? but. The real thing that gives me pause is my first grader. And this is the big thing that I wanted to say is that we need to understand that while the high school kids are basically doing okay and you know everybody's different in how they're handling stuff is that we have the little, little kids, the kindergartners and the first graders who have barely been in school. 
they are missing the most critical and formative times in their lives. And I have the resources to have a schedule where I can work and be super available to them. I've got him in a pod class, but he is struggling so much. And his teacher is doing so much every single day and we're working above and beyond to help him. But the fact of the matter is, is that we can't treat all of the kids, the kindergartners and the first graders, the exact same as we are with high school students. We have got to get out of the mindset that a one size fits all. And I know that this is a dangerous and deadly virus, but we've got to come up with something that focuses on addressing the needs of these little kids who are at a point where they are never going to be able to get to the comfortable part of high school where they can kind of coast and be enjoying, you know, less of a strict routine and whatnot, because they are missing being able to actually learn how to read and write. They're missing the most critical skills that I just, I can't even imagine. And the Zoom does not work for them. It absolutely does not work. We are doing the utter best that we can and we have it so much better than everybody else. But I think I speak for a majority of people who have little, little kids that this is not a way for them to learn and they're missing such critical learning time right now. And if there could be any way where we address lower elementary school kids who drastically need this in-person learning and it, it, we can't teach, parents can't um, teach foundations and things like that, we're trying, but they're missing such critical learning right now that this is a generation that is never going to get this back. And our kids overall have a lot of resources and support from parents, but there are so many people out there who do not have this. And if we're not teaching them now, they're not going to be ready for second grade next year. They're not gonna be ready for third. And it is just creating a lost generation right in this little pocket. So I just wanted to really fast waste your time. I'm sorry, I know everybody's exhausted, but just to keep in mind those little, little kids who they are missing just critical fundamental skills and formation right now. And I just, I think it's extremely dangerous right now to continue on this path for those little guys. All right, and I appreciate all the time and I appreciate everything the board's doing. And Dr. McDowell, welcome. We're really happy to have you and we hope you enjoy us here. Thank you. Thank you, Jody. Um, I saw there's someone, Matt D, but we do need your, your full name and your address when you, when you say it out loud. Thank it's Dwyer, you. Matt Dwyer on uh, West Franklin Avenue. Um, I, have, I just have a question. There was a lot of talk about science and how science is informing our, uh, the data of science is informing our, your decision-making process. What's the direct data you have on Collingswood schools in terms of transmission rates and the, the safety risks that that proposes? Do, does anyone have number of transmissions that have happened in our schools or number of even cases that have happened in our schools? Um, I, would say, I would just ask that question and then I would just make my second point is um, these are not, I know, I know it's, it's hard work and there's, there's nuance and layers to pulling this off, but it's, it's achievable to bring kids back five days a week. It's very achievable. People are, people are doing it all throughout the state and the country, but, um, but that's for you to wrestle with. But, but I'm interested in those stats. Do we have anything local in Collingswood? I think stats in Europe are good and stats in the County are good, but what, what are our stats telling us? Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Dwyer. And I'm not sure if you were on the call earlier, but we're not, um, we're not just going to, answer back and forth right now because we um, we want to make sure that we have the most accurate data, but we will have, um, please look to, to Dr. McDowell's uh, Friday weekly update for um, for more detailed information kind of based on all the, the comments that we've heard tonight. Um, and is there anyone else? I don't think so, right? I don't see anybody. Okay, so so just to, um, to wrap up, um, I wanted to thank everyone who came out tonight uh, to, to share their, their feedback with us. Uh, we really do appreciate it. This has been a long meeting, um, but we, we are taking your feedback seriously. Um, and we will be uh, you know, discussing everything that we heard tonight. Um, I'm positive that the school leaders and the district will also be having discussions um, as they already are, but, but taking into consideration everything that was, that was said again tonight. Um, we know everything about this pandemic and the situations that we've been put in is, uh, as a result of it, is hard and that's not remotely inadequate enough word to describe it. Um, 
and we know that everyone is just advocating for what they feel is the be is best for their their child and or their children and we hear you um, and as we heard tonight there there's a variety of um, of opinions on on what is best for for their their child and we're trying to to kind of weigh all of those factors um, as Dr. McDowell and, and everyone who gave that presentation earlier in the meeting um, pointed out and you know, we hear you, we appreciate it. We absolutely agree that students benefit from uh, the most from being in person and our plan has always been and will continue to be to do, to do that in uh, as swift a way as possible while also following the guidelines from the public health experts um, that we have chosen to follow in the CDC and the New Jersey Department of Health. And uh, as was said earlier in the meeting as well, um, if there's anyone who has an individual concern about their, their child or, um, or their children, uh, please do not hesitate to, to reach out. The first place to go would, would really be your, your child's teacher because they are gonna know them best. Um, and then from there, obviously, if you still have concerns, you, you contact your school administrator. And, uh, and if things are not resolved adequately or you do not feel things are resolved adequately there, you have Dr. McDowell to reach out to and the board to reach out to. Um, we are we are here and we're listening and we want to make sure that that um, you know that. A couple of other quick things. Um, please continue to check the website for updates and um, to read Dr. McDowell's um, very thorough uh, updates on Fridays, which not only gives us information about our school uh, reopening plans, but also really great information about what's going on in all of our schools. Um, across both of our districts, which is which is a great thing to, to hear. Um, also, just to kind of reiterate two, two points, um, any updates that the CDC and the New Jersey Department of Health make, um, we are going to follow them because we have said that those are what our metrics are. So if the CDC comes out with a, with a revamped uh, guideline of three feet instead of six feet, we are not sticking with six feet because we're going to be stubborn about our plan. We're going to follow the guidelines and, and switch to, to three feet. And I want to I wanted to stress that and, and um, really stress that, that that we're following those metrics. Um, so the guidance that they give us is the, is the guidance that we're going to use. And um, I had one other point and, and I didn't write it down. And that's my fault. And it's late and I forgot it. But um, but also just I saw someone ask in the chat and I saw that Mr. Dickens, Dickerson uh, gave this information. So in case you missed it, all of these board meetings are recorded and you can find them on the um, Collinswood Public School District's YouTube channel. So uh, if you wanted to go back and check with uh, more of the presentation that was given earlier, um, please do so. But uh, the last thing I'm gonna end on before we adjourn is just that uh, reiterating what was said earlier in the meeting, um, by, by Dr. McDowell and by other school board, or not school board, I'm sorry, school leaders, that uh, we fully uh, intend to create a plan for full in-person instruction in the fall. And yes, there will be um, other scenarios that we will plan for as well, because that's what you need to do. Um, but we, we are working towards that plan and uh, we will be in touch with lots of folks, as Dr. McDowell said, over the next a um, couple of weeks to, to get more feedback from, from parents and community members. And we appreciate um, all of the, the, the people with expertise for, for offering that to us. So with that, uh, at uh, 1030 tonight, I'm going to ask uh, for a motion to adjourn. So moved. Is there a second? Second. second. All in favor? Aye. 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 Thank you very much, everyone.